e noi tātou. Takataka te hau ki te uru, takataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina kina ki uta, ki mā tara tara ki pai. Ehi akiana ti atakura, he teo, he hoka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Uh, so kia ora everybody and welcome to our very first strategy and policy committee meeting of the year. Before we move into formal business, we've got a really exciting deputation this morning um, via Tom Frost, our new Nothing But Net uh, manager. Welcome, Tom. And Tom is joined by some of the Spark team. Uh, we've got Ricky, Fiona and Tony in the room with us who are going to present to us for about 20 minutes. And then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for question and answers if the um, time allows. So. 9.30, Tom will crack into it and I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Kia ora, everyone. Um, those who don't know me, my name's Tom Frost, and I'm the uh, program manager for the Nothing But Net strategy, um, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of. Um, and today we've got um, some great present, oh, great presentation from the team at Spark. So we've got Ricky, who's the Māori business development manager at Spark. We've got Fiona, who's the community development manager at Spark, and Tony De Fritz, who's across the IAT and mobility streams within the Spark ecosystem. So what I'll do is I'll just pass it on. This is about creating synergies with the Spark and um, the partnership ecosystem I'm trying to create with the Nothing But Net strategy, um, and you will see that come through. Now, Ricky's little presentation um, is, is a shortened version, so what I'm going to do, uh, just so you're aware, is we'll have an internal FNDC presentation from Ricky within the next couple of weeks, um, with the hope that we can also then present to this committee uh, in future, because I think there's some really exciting stuff in there that does lend itself and, as I said, create synergies within the Nothing But Net strategy. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ricky and you can start with the presentation. Cool. Thanks, Tom. I'll just bring up the presentation and we can crack into it. So hopefully the technology works. Thanks, Tony. Um, it's coming up for you guys. Uh, can you see that uh, presentation? Yep. Cool. All right. I'll hand over to um, uh, Ricky to uh, start us off. Cool. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Ricky Hollings tāku ingoa. Hei uri ahau o Ngāti Rangi Nui. Uh, no tō ranga moana o ku tupuna. Uh, ko ko te kai ara taki rau taki Māori uh, ahau uh, ki kora Aotearoa. So greetings everybody. Um, my name is Ricky. I'm a descendant of Ngāti Rangi Nui and my ancestors hail from Tauranga Moana uh, and I'm the Māori development lead uh, here at Kora Aotearoa Spark NZ and I lead out uh, on our Māori strategy. Um, our purpose here at Spark is Afina Tia Ngatanga Takatoa or Aotearoa Kia Mato Mato Te Tipu Iti Ao Matihiko uh, to help all New Zealand grow and stand strong and thrive in a digital world. Um, we began our journey in 2017 with our first uh, Horizon One strategy, which was uh, called Te Pou Arataki. And our focus at that time was uh, on Kanohikitia, uh, for our people to be empowered, to be connected uh, and to be seen. And Horizon One was about uh, understanding ourselves as an organisation in the space that, that we inha inhabit uh, and building our understanding and capabilities to engage with RTL Māori. And by understanding these two worlds, um, when we brought them together, we identified the shared space that exists between us, the space where we could share our experiences and, um, and work together. And this image here, um, the, the purpose is slightly different from our business purpose, which talks about uh, helping all New Zealanders win uh, in in the digital world. And when we took um, a te ao Māori perspective on that, um, the the term win didn't sit well with us, and it was part of our under but developing our understanding of how we um, show up in these different spaces, the language that we use and the way we step into uh, these different worlds, not just te ao Māori, um, but other communities and worlds uh, around Aotearoa. Another example is uh, on this slide, we have a map of New Zealand on the left and, uh, and a map of Aotearoa uh, on the right. And this really symbolises to our people um, just how, how the, the world can be um, perceived differently in many different ways and in many subtle ways. So I like to share this, um, this image with everybody just to show that um, on, on the left of New Zealand, nothing, the north, south, east and west doesn't change, uh, but on the right, um, it, the uh, up and down changes. So, for example, sharing with our people that uh, if we're in Tehiku Wotika in, in Kirikiri uh, and we're going to 
uh, the, the tail of the fish, and we're going to Te Upoko, Te Kia Maui, uh, towards Wellington, um, we might say that we're going up to the head. So this is really just about starting our journey and understanding um, how the world can be perceived differently. If we go to the next slide, Tony. So in 2019, at the end of 2019, we came to the end of um, our Horizon One strategy and we reflected on, on what we'd achieved. Um, we signed a number of partnership uh, agreements and it was really important for us to build those connections out with communities and build those partnerships to um, help us navigate uh, on our journey together. And we looked back in, at our commitment to the revitalization of Te Reo Māori uh, in the workplace and the mahi that we'd done um, with things like uh, creating the Kupu app, um, which I, I don't know if you're all aware of that app, but it's an app where you can use your phone to take uh, an image and that image can be translated uh, into Te Reo, te reo Māori. Um, at that time as well, we, we felt really proud of what we'd achieved and it become of um I became aware of the fact that it was time for us to actually look to begin to weave our uh, Maori strategy across the other parts of our business and to carry it forward and out into our communities and uh, we settled on the concept uh, of Takura Waitupu and Takura Waitupu is something that for our our staff here at Spark um they can begin to embellish their own kōrawai and carry it with them as they step out on this journey that we're all on uh, into Te Ao Māori. And um, if we look at this, uh, our central thread here is to Tiriti O Waitangi. And we really had to ask ourselves, well, how do we show up as, as, a, as a good treaty partner and what does the treaty mean to us? So for us, it means connecting us to the aspirations of our ancestors for a, a fairer and more balanced society. And um, we embrace the three Ps to help guide us in the expectations of our communities and the way um, that we partner and, and build partnerships where each partner feels equal and providing the space to allow each other to lead at different times. For me, um, what showed up was um, really around participation. Sometimes we enter partnerships and we don't really participate um, in them in a way that we can maximise the benefits and, and the potential that can exist between us. So participation is really uh, important for us to focus on making sure that we are building partnerships that empower others to participate in that relationship. And, the, and for us to really start to understand the shared value that can exist between us. And the third P, uh, protection, is really about us acknowledging um, the tonga that, that we carry sometimes and taking responsibility for the protection of Te Reo Māori and uh, me ona tikanga. Um, on the right, uh, uh, mana taurite is uh, equity, so that's the pathway um, for all our people um, towards equity and equity of opportunity. So we're really big about bridging uh, the digital divide. And I think during the pandemic, one of the things we found is that um, is that access and connectivity um, doesn't really meet the needs uh, of our people. And it's really important to ensure that they have uh, the skills uh, in order to use our technology. So Manatoriti really connects um, our korowai to the, the mahi that our, our Spark Foundation do. Um, so we have things that sit in there such as um, Skinny Jump, our not-for-profit um, uh, broadband connectivity option to really help try and bridge that uh, digital divide and get those whānau members connected that, that don't have uh, broadband. And as I mentioned, the pandemic really amplified uh, the needs in our communities. Uh, I'm really proud that we launched it on the day we first we went into um, lockdown and we just were overwhelmed um, with the response. Uh, and I guess one of the things we did was pivot a lot of our people to help focus on getting those modems out to get those whānau, get our tamariki connected so that they could carry on with, um, with their education. Um, as I mentioned, we've we really learned through the pandemic uh, around the needs of our people uh, to have the digital skills in order to um, to leverage and maximise the opportunity of being connected in a connected world. Um, and so we have a number of partnerships which are really focused uh, on helping uh, 
our community's uh, Step Up, Stepping Up program is one of those programs. Um, and we have a relationship with uh, Digital Alliance Aotearoa. So a number of these initiatives are run in local community centres and libraries, et cetera. Um, we have also uh, the Take Two partnership, which has uh, been signed up with Department of Corrections which is really exciting for us, is really looking towards breaking uh, recidivism in the justice system and providing opportunities for, um, for clients of corrections to develop skills in the tech sector and set them up to step in, step in back into their communities uh, and help them um, um, take different pathways in their lives. And it's not just about developing skills, that program is also about um, getting people to create uh, roles and opportunities to help them uh, on those journeys. Uh, to the left, Toy 2 Sustainability is really about us all standing together um, and for future generations. And that gives us that, that intergenerational perspective that exists in um, Te Ao Māori. It's more than just climate change. Um, and for us, it's about what does our organisation look like in the future? What does our workforce look like in the future? And what are the skills that we need to develop um, for our future generations to be successful in a digital world? So we have a number of relationships with uh, universities and educational organisations and we're trying to develop pathways. We really focused on in 2030, 34% uh, of the workforce is going to identify as Māori and Pacifica and the fact that only we only have 4% participation uh, in the tech sector today. So we're really looking at, at how can we create pathways and um, I guess create a more welcoming um, sector to help engage with um, that large um, portion of, of our workforce. Uh, on the right, we have our spark values. To Hono, we connect. Whakamana, we empower. Maya, we are bold. And Mato Mato, uh, we succeed together. And then on the left, um, it was really important to, to show that we had two sets of values and that we were brace, embracing the values of others. And we have some um, some some values that we've taken from Te Ao Māori, Kaitiakitanga, Manakitanga. And these etc. And these values, they resonate really, really well um, across our organisation and all the different roles that we play. Um, Manaki Tanga really asking us to think about um, how we are caring for each other and how we are creating a space that's, that, that is welcoming um, for our future employees. And as I mentioned, how can we attract more Māori uh, and, and Pacifica? One of the really interesting ones that we, we thought about for a while was mana whenua tanga. And it was really important for us to, as an organisation, to understand that not all Māori are the same and not all communities um, have the same needs. So really for us to focus on building those connections at community levels so that we can, A, partner with them, um, collaborate, work together and share our experiences in different ways to meet the different um, needs of our communities. And one really important one down there at the bottom is Humarie. Now we can be seen as being a, a big mean uh, lean corporate machine. So it's really, really important that, um, that our footsteps are gentle as we walk into these spaces uh, and we do so that in a very inclusive um, and embracing ways. Now I'm just conscious of time and we only have 20 minutes. So um, at a very high level, I think this just represents um, who we are uh, as an organisation and who we are aspiring to be. Um, I'm really proud of our, um, our investment in the revitalisation of Te Reo Māori and, and this year I have 100 staff currently that have signed up for a 12 month uh, Te Reo Māori programme, uh, which I'm just about to launch to all of our 5,000 plus whānaus. So yeah, we're on a journey. Kia ora. Thanks Ricky, um, that's great. Um, yeah, my name's Tony. I work in the um, 5G Emerging Tech and IoT team. Um, so um, basically in New Zealand, we're seeing about six and a half million connections in Aotearoa, and we've seen a huge data growth in our network. Um, it's, it's exponential, so it's increased more than 50 times since uh, 2012. And that's driven by the increase in number of devices and the way we're using our devices. So because of that data growth, um, 5G is critical for Spark to help us meet um, that growth of data. Uh, by allowing more capacity in our network. So as part of um, the upgrade around New Zealand, we're going to be upgrading three sites in the Far North District Council. So it's the Kaitaia site, the Paihia site, and the Kaikaui site. 
Um, we did some research and um, we're predicting that 5G um, can add uh, up to $78 million to the economy in the far north over the next 10 years. And that's through things like uh, attract, attracting and retaining talented people, um, uh, businesses and capital, research and development, enabling smart services and just basically being connected to our innovation to improve the com competitiveness of, of the far north. Um, if we look at um, 5G as a technology, there are certain key attributes that 5G uh, brings over time. They're not all available at once. Uh, the first attribute we've got today is speed and capacity. Um, so that allows us devices to connect faster to the network um, and brings us more capacity. So for example, today you might get 20 to 30 megabits per second if you do a speed test on 4G. With, with, with 5G, I'm seeing up to 600 megabits per second when I do speed tests. So what that means is that we can support more connections in the network. So it's particularly important for areas of high utilization, um, like stadiums and events and things like that. But it's also important to allow um, increased connectivity for our wireless broadband customers so we can support more wireless broadband customers in those areas. Some of the other attributes are around um, latency and reliability. So basically the reliability of the connection is, is greater. So with this, we can start doing things like um, smart factories and autonomous vehicles and, and cloud gaming and such forth. Um, massive IoT is another attribute. Um, we've got IoT today, but massive IoT is basically bringing the de density of devices uh, much greater. So everything will be connected from your shirt to your fridge to, to clothing and things like that. So the density of devices and also the amount of data those devices uh, or things are, are, are sending. So you're starting to see wearables like smart glasses with augmented reality and things like that. Um, edge computing it ties in with um, latency as well, basically removing the, the time it takes for uh, um, data to transfer from one point to another. And that's important for things like um, gaming and if you want real time uh, video analytic kind of solutions for health and safety reasons. So identifying people that are um, in hazards and, and sending out alerts as quickly as possible. And one of the other attributes is um, network slicing. Today in our 4G network is just one big pipe and uh, really everyone's just using the same pipe. But with the network slicing, we can start to partition that pipe into different attributes. So for example, a gaming attribute might want low latency, but lots of speed, whereas a wireless broadband uh, device might only need lots of speed, but latency is not so critical. So allowing that kind of network slicing and, and allowing private networks as well. So those are some of the attributes that 5G will bring over time. But today we're sitting up on the top right there with, with speed and capacity. Um, just to summarize the sites, uh, the three sites we'll be upgrading, uh, Kaitaia, uh, Paihia and Kaikoui. Um, the Paihia one is in the town center there, the Kaikoui one is on the exchange and the Kaitaia site is up behind Kaitaia there. So when we go and do those upgrades, we're basically just adding some more equipment onto those sites um, to support 5G technology. Um, one of the other key things as part of connectivity that's been going on, as you're probably all aware, is the Rural Connectivity Group, which is the uh, joint venture between the three uh, mobile operators and the government uh, for delivering um, mobile coverage to rural New Zealand. Um, so just a view of some upcoming sites that will be deployed in, in the Far North District Council over the coming uh, year. Um, so you can, I've got those listed there on the left and um, on the right there is the green represents a uh, 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 prediction of the coverage from once all the sites for um, RCG are delivered and I, I think there's 59 live across the northern region today so the other ones um, there's some coming uh, this month um, why much Cow. Um, so yeah, so just a view of what's upcoming with uh, rural connectivity. And the other thing I'd encourage is um, to make best use of that coverage because it's uh, 4G technology um, is that um, people uh, should upgrade their handsets to um, have phones that support voice over LTE so that we can make uh, voice calls on, on that uh, coverage from the RCG group. Um, I also work in the IoT team at Spark, so um, these are some of the key um, solutions we're seeing uh, great interest in around Aotearoa. Uh, water monitoring is a, a very big topic, so this is smart water meters, so we're rolling out smart water meters in, in Auckland and, and Dunedin and some other locations. So this is, allows uh, people to see real time or near real time the usage of water and doesn't mean, mean you have um, readers needing to go out there. The other thing is around the quality of the water as well, so making sure that um, say farmers are, are meeting their expectations on nitrate levels and things like that. So water monitoring is a, a key uh, IoT solution we're seeing a lot of interest in New Zealand. Uh, then we've got um, things like temperature and humidity monitoring. So for example, we've got um, 
temperature monitoring in vaccine fridges in the Hawke's Bay District Council. So that sends an alarm if the fridges malfunction. So it saved them tens of thousands of dollars because I managed to pick up uh, fridges before they malfunction and the vaccines um, uh, have to be thrown out. Uh, fleet tracking is another uh, key area. So for example, the final district uh, council fleet, we could put trackers on them and basically allows you to make better utilization of your uh, resources and health and safety. For example, it could send an alert if there's an accident with the vehicles and so forth. Um, we've got some parking solutions. Um, it was going great guns until everyone worked from home, but that's around making better use of um, parking for, um, for organizations. Smart cities and environments. Um, we've got um, in the Wynyard Quarter, we've got a, a number of smart um, city installations like seats and uh, smart rubbish bins and so forth. So if you're ever down in Auckland, please feel free to come down. I can take you a tour just to show you some of the innovative things we're doing in the smart cities and environment space. And then healthy work workplaces as well, or workspaces. So this is uh, putting uh, uh, sensors into houses to monitor humidity and heat and, and, and so forth. So we're doing work with Kainga Aura, uh, putting sensors in, in houses to make sure that they're healthy. So a lot of um, interesting stuff going on in the IoT space. And um, in Spark, we have an innovation studio which showcases um, IoT solutions and some emerging technology. Um, that's in our Spark City. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, come down and we can take you on a tour through that, that space, basically showcasing all of those IoT solutions and some of the new tech that's coming up. And I'll hand over to Fiona to discuss how we engage with the community on our upgrades. Kia ora Tony, Ricky, nā mihi nui kia koutou, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Fiona Matthews and my role at Spark is really um, to ensure regulatory compliance and I also uh, assist with the community engagement we went for our physical infrastructure and our new sites. So just wanted to touch um, briefly today on community engagement uh, and how we uh, pass our, pass our uh, digital message on, um, particularly for for 5G, as Tony said, the sites that are being upgraded are really existing sites in situ already and, um, and will be like for like equipment antennas swapped out. So in a situation like that, um, if there are residents in the immediate vicinity, we'll do a, a letter drop just to let them know there you may see some workmen or some um, people operated uh, working on the site. Um, and then it's primarily in the situation uh, not a proactive engagement, but a reactive. So if people have questions, there's a, a dedicated number or 0800 um, number which comes through the Spark call centre or email address that comes through to me and my team um, so we can provide people further information um, about what we're doing in the region and um, how it may impact them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the end of where the Spark team are at and we are more than happy to take any of your questions now. Thank you so much for that team. That was really um, informative. Members, I've just asked if anybody can raise their hand, Councillor Foy and then Councillor Collard. Thank you. Um, Atamaria Kirokoto, um, Core Felicity Foy TNA. I um, just had some questions, and maybe if it's Fiona, maybe about comms and, and the 5G aspect. With we do have um, some fear in the community about 5G and basically how that's not addressed in the National Environmental Standard for um, Telecommunications and how that's not a statute that is under the control of a council. Um, and some of our community do get upset about that. And I'm aware of um, maybe some police action relating to trying to chop cell towers down, etc. cetera. Um, so I think with this rollout, and I guess it's a question, is there some sort of education around that and, um, maybe as a council how we can detail to community what's within our control as a, a territorial authority um, and what is set out by central government under the NES and by Spark itself and their decisions. Sure, thank you for that. Um, so so yes, you, you are correct. Um, there 
there can be some tension in the 5G rollout and the National Environmental Standard is a statute that's set by uh, central government and within that uh, has regulations that Spark and all mobile operators uh, must meet in terms of their radio frequency emissions um, to ensure the safety of, um, of our mobile towers um, throughout throughout Aotearoa. Uh, the statute is administered by the Far North District Council or by all district councils. So the uh, legislation is set by central government and um, the council administers the, the regulation. Um, and so for our upgrades, uh, we, one of one of my jobs is to ensure that we're in compliance with um, with all the um, regulations as set out, and that includes sometimes obtaining certificate of compliance from the council, um, or um, or ensuring that that what we're how we're working is um, is within a permitted activity um, realm. But um, I appreciate that, as you're saying, you know, there are still some sensitivities to 5G in the community. And so what we have been finding as we've been um, as we've been rolling out 5G is really that um, the people that are, are, are very against 5G, there isn't a lot we can we can tell them to to change their mind. We um, we certainly um, have really great resources through the Chief Science Advisor for um, for the government and through the Ministry of Health. So we will always direct, try and direct people to these really reputable um, sources of fact, as opposed to other things that they might find online. But acknowledge that it, it isn't always easy. And um, as an organisation, we're really keen to engage and to talk to people if they have queries and to try and point them in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Fiona. And just one feedback, it's not a question. Um, Pukanui Spark Tower has always got loading issues. They've got a huge population increase in Pukanui. So just some feedback for you there. Okay, thanks for that. I'll, I'll take a look. There might be some upgrades and, and plan for that area there, but I'll, I'll take a look and feed that back to Tom. Thanks, Councillor Foyer. I'm sure we could probably all chuck in a, um, a few little bits of local feedback. Uh, that's uh, maybe a conversation for another day. I've got Councillor Collard. And then Councillor Vucic, Tina, I'm really mindful we've only got three minutes, so thank you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, this will be a very quick. Uh, probably a question for, for Ricky uh, in terms of um, things like connectivity. I was recently in the Kaimamea, um region and was astounded, not, not so much astounded because I'm one of these people that has issues in terms of connectivity and, and our ability to connect and there through the available connections and then affordability that runs with that connectivity uh, and once once that is achieved the necessary skills to make it work because it just don't happen overnight and it's not osmosis you have got to participate in it um, well, these other guys on council court or i label myself as a dinosaur, perhaps, and uh, there's still quite a few of us there. So, how how do you propose to deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, there there are a number of partnerships which we have, which are really focused on um, developing um, skill sets in the community. So, for example, uh, we've been rolling out uh, Marae Digital Connectivity on behalf of uh, Tapuni Kokiri, and in phase two of the RFP was. Um, rolling training across the back of that to make sure that our Fano, who are the trustees and who care for our marae, um, could develop the skills. There are other programs which are usually run in um, community libraries and community centres, um, such as the Take Two initiative, um, to provide the space for people to come in and to, to develop those skills. So I think the, the way that we respond to that is through those partnerships and, and putting those, um, those training opportunities out there in communities. It's certainly a very rural environment that we live in in terms of getting people into those those facilities. Yeah, uh, maybe the Marae uh, will work, uh, but certainly it's an effort in terms of those rural people. Yeah, look, and um, you know, we are starting to see Fano as we are getting Marae connected. 
uh, looking at well, what are the opportunities um, for Farno uh, now that now that they have um, this connectivity? And I think that that's something that we can look at moving forward is uh, working uh, with Marae to open up um, those local centres for Farno um, to possibly extend uh, those those programs out into more rural areas. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ricky. Uh, Councillor Vucic. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I, this question, I think, Tony, you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. coverage or that was mentioned and, and, and well, in fact, probably all that. So one of the things in the far north is actually coverage. Our terrain may not be that good. And even around Kaiko, I noticed with Spark, you go outside of Kaiko, you don't get mm -hmm. much coverage. So the question is really is, where is your cell tower that, you know, and... Um, in fact, where is it located in Kai Kai? Because the coverage doesn't seem to be good. And, and what are you doing about coverage, especially with 5G rollout, which I think is crucial uh, in the rest of the far north? Yeah, I believe the Kai Kai. Did you say Kai Kai or Kai Tai? Sorry. Oh, Kai Kai. I, I was just curious. Oh, Kai Kai. Go. Yeah, it's in it's in the, telef um, the telephone exchange in the middle of town there. Um, so um, yeah, that's it. Probably doesn't provide that wider area coverage around uh, Kai Kai. Uh, I guess from a coverage perspective, that's the RCG um, group um, is tasked with um, extending that coverage out into the the wider community. So um, there may be a next a, another tranche of um, funding to expand coverage. So I'd encourage you to feedback any coverage concerns th directly through to the RCG team, um, and they can uh, liaise directly with the Ministry of Business and Innovation and um, if they're looking at uh, further expansion of that program uh, for coverage. So I definitely encourage you to feedback areas where you have coverage concerns through that channel. Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt, it's, it's Tom here. Um, hey, um, I had a meeting with um, Imbi actually last week um, around coverage, um, and that's definitely on their radar. So we're working closely um, as part of uh, Northland Inc. and the Digital Enablement Group for Northland, um, specifically around what can we do to fill those gaps. Um, and they admitted that their um, approach around RBI 2 and RCG was um, pretty myopic. Um, and it didn't cover where people were going. So they've actually taken that information on board and we're working with them to provide more details around where those gaps are and how they can work with central government to get that funding. So any information, any feedback from anyone, I'm happy to take that on board and, and collate it together in one single piece and then work with MB around that as well. All right. Yeah, thanks. Happy to do that. Because our location with council could probably help. Even on Monument Hill, will give you far better coverage. That's 50 metres above the town. And it's another site that's 340 metres, probably 150 metres above the town. Uh, that would make a big difference because when you go outside the urban zone, it cuts out. It almost seems like there's a town boundary cut out. That's how bad it is here, but especially in the rest of the north. So I'll be keen to actually provide that feedback. Thanks. That's fantastic. Thanks, Councillor Vucic. Uh, Member Ward, I'm mindful you've got your hand up. So if you have a quick question, uh, then we can squeeze it in. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, mainly my concern is around affordability, uh, being a community representative and inclusiveness, I, although I think the training and upskilling is fabulous. We do have a lot of people in our communities that don't have phones, uh, that share phones, and whether they have coverage or not, and they don't have smart devices. And my concern is about um, widening that gap between the, the rich and the poor and the haves and the have-nots and how we're going to actually manage that moving forward. Um, Tom here again, I can answer that. Um, I've actually got a, um, I'm on a part of a committee which is the Digital Equity Coalition of Aotearoa um, and part of that we have a um, cohort meeting next Monday, funny enough, and it's about affordability in that space um, and some of the programs, and I know we're running out of time, that Nothing But Net is looking at is to address some of those um, in a more creative way. So how do we approach it differently? How do we have that different lens, if you like, um, that meets those community outcomes? So that's obviously it's a community-led initiative and we want to do that way. So um, the, all these things are in train, um, and I've got some proof of concepts that are coming up um, in the not too distant future in that very space. So watch the space, and I'll give some feedback about how we can address those things going forward. That's fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I have a quick question on behalf of Member Gmur uh, Hall now from our Bay of Islands Whangarau Community Board. I think it's for Tony. Just in terms of the 5G rollout, she was just keen to understand what that time frame was looking like. Uh, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Fiona, uh, I think we'll be starting the upgrades in the next um, or month or so. Um, so probably with um, late March or early April sort of timeframe. 
Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much um, for joining us today, Ricky, Fiona and Tony. Uh, it was great to meet you all and I look forward to hearing more updates in this space. Tom, it sounds like there's some really cool things in the pipeline. Um, so thank you all for your mahi uh, on behalf of the far north. Go and take care. Stay slightly cool in that humid, um, <laughs> lovely weather that we're enjoying right now. Uh, and we'll see you soon. Kakite. Kia ora. Kakite. Kia ora. Uh, all right, committee. So that brings us back into the formal uh, session of our committee meeting today. Uh, and I'm going to just kick off with apologies and declarations of interest, which I didn't do first. So I've received apologies from Councillor Tipania and His Worship the Mayor. Do I have any further apologies or declarations of interest, please? Uh, if not, I am happy to move that those apologies be received. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Collard, thank you. Uh, we'll just go through the voting. I'm in support. Councillor Clendon. Support. Deputy Mayor Court. In support. Councillor Collard. Support. Councillor Foy. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. A member ward. Aye. That's carried. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so just a couple of um, housekeeping. Again, welcome to our 2022 uh, meeting. A reminder to all members, when you're not speaking, please keep your microphones off. But when you are speaking, if you could obviously turn them on and if you can, pop your cameras on as well. Uh, welcome to all of our staff who have joined us today and our uh, CEO, our SLT team. Uh, and anybody who is joining in from our YouTube channel. I just want to take a second. Uh, Marlima, who is our meeting administrator, is not with us today. It is her birthday, uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that we pass on happy birthday wishes to her, and I hope she's having a fantastic day off. Uh, we've got Aisha here with us, uh, as well as, I'm not sure if we've all met Joshna. Joshna, are you there? Are you able to just pop your camera on for us, please? So Joshna is a new member of the uh, Democracy Services team and she'll be supporting us as well. I'm not sure if she can pop her camera on, but welcome to Joshna. Uh, so on that note, we will move into our formal meeting for today. Kia ora, Joshna. Nice to see you. Uh, so that brings us to item 4.1, confirmation of previous minutes. The recommendation is that the Strategy and Policy Committee agrees that the minutes of the meeting held 24th of November 2021 be confirmed as a true and correct record. Do I have a mover for that, please? Uh, Councillor Vucic, thank you. Happy to second, Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Do I have any comments, amendments or questions? No? Excellent. Uh, we will pop it to the vote then. Thank you. I am in support. Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court. In support. Councillor Collard. Councillor Foy. Aye. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. Member Ward. Aye. Sure, I'm in support as well, this Councillor uh, Tepania. Well, Councillor Tepania, uh, thank you for that. So that brings us to item 5.1. So I'm just going to jump in um, another hefty, robust agenda um, for our committee to kick off the year. Some really, really excellent reports. Uh, really mindful that we want to wrap up by one o'clock and get some good break time in there as well. So. Uh, I don't think I'll need to crack the whip, but just um, a reminder about our timeframes. So we have a recommendation in front of us here, item 5.1, uh, that the, the review of the equity and access for people with disability policy. The recommendation is that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that Council A agree that access and equity for people with disabilities policy should continue with amendment, and B agree a strategy is the most appropriate way to address access to council services, facilities and assets in the far north. Would somebody like to move that, please? Kelly. Councillor Stratford, thank you. I'm happy to I second. Ah, Councillor Collard, thank you. 
Uh, and at that point, Darren, I will hand over to you and your team for any opening statements. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to see you all in the start of 2022. Uh, and we're starting off the way we mean to um, continue following on from 2021. And we've got a uh, what I would call a, a a good sized first up meeting agenda for us um, with a number of uh, recommendations and decisions to be made to Council. So I'm um, looking forward to working through those this morning. Um, the paper that's in front of you um, at 5.1 um, is a review of the equity and access for um, people with disabilities uh, into the policy. So I'm going to ask Briar to speak to this if there's any um, technical points that we really need to be aware of. It's a really good paper that Caitlin had worked on. Um, as most of you will be aware, um, Caitlin left us uh, just before December and is now pursuing a career in uh, teaching, as I understand. That's where her passion is. So we're really um, we're really pleased that we were able to support her into that. So, uh, Briar, over to you. Just on mute. I am on mute. So good morning, everybody, and uh, yes, welcome back uh, to 2022. Um, so with the equity and access policy, um, as you are aware, work has commenced on the regional accessibility strategy, which aims to support our access needs community. So, however, this will take at least two years before implementation begins. So in the meantime, Council can amend the policy to better support our access needs community uh, by improving language and ensuring a comprehensive implementation plan across Council. And so, and then once the strategy has been developed, Council be, will be able to reevaluate and review the policy again. Thank you for that, Briar. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, thank you for those opening statements. Councillor Stratford, as mover, would you like to kick us off with any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge Caitlin. She came to the Disability Action Group meeting. I think it's, is it two? Oh, it feels like longer, but it's about two. No, it's more than two because it was pre-COVID. Um, many years back to kick off the review of the policy, you know, open the conversation and the Disability Action Group were very keen to uh, review the policy and um, they did, they do already um, have a strong view on the amendments which are reflected in the report that we see before us today. So I support the resolution as it stands. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Collard, uh, as seconder, did you have any questions or comments to make? No, nothing further to add, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I support the, um, the recommendation, though one could almost argue that the most appropriate way to address access is to actually implement some of the existing policy. It seems there was a big rush of blood to the head in 2013 Council established a policy, but it seems very little happened in the meantime. I think it's really telling that in the paper tells us that in 2019, a third of management and leadership in the council didn't know there was such a policy. And I think that speaks volumes to the fact that, you know, this is a failing of large bureaucracies and small to I'll get a policy, a strategy, put it on the shelf, haven't we done well, and let's go you know, coffee time. So without pointing fingers, you know, this is all historic now, but I would hate us to see this review used as an excuse to do nothing for the next two years. I think we have to get a bit more active. The things we know need doing, um, public loos, are all of our council buildings fully accessible? Can we provide um, uh, interpretation to people with with hearing or visual difficulties? Can we sort out our public toilets? So these are things we can do today, tomorrow, next week. I'd hate us, as I say, to use this review as an excuse to do nothing better than we have been doing since 2013. I think we should just be getting on with it as well as developing a better and stronger policy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kingdom. Points well made. Uh, Member Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow on from um, Councillor Clendon, um, I tend toward um, option two. I think it's all about implementation and action 
which is the, um, I guess, you know, if we're going to look at council and, and how we function or don't function in this area from a community board level, um, we have the bylaws and the schedules that, that accompany those. And we worked on those several years ago in relation, for example, to disability parking, and they haven't been implemented. I think the fact that there's no baseline data, um, council could look to community board for a huge contribution there in establishing data in the first instance as we're aware on the ground of the changes that have taken place over the last 10, 20 years in our communities and those that need addressing. Um, some of, I know half the councillors um, are still there and a lot of the staff when it came to the last round of um, trying to implement things but nothing has happened. Bearing in mind a delegation of the community board is to actually um, recommend or um, amend existing bylaws. Uh, that's all very well, but if there's going to be no action at the council table, um, it concerns me that if we look at a strategy where we've already got schedules and bylaws that are not being adhered to, that we are going to get caught up in, as it states, an option for it's going to take more time and more resources. We don't have that. We need to be acting now. So from a board perspective, um, I'm sure all, all chairs are happy to work uh, with staff and council in moving forward some of the things that are there that haven't been actioned. So um, without wanting to sound too negative, I just am putting it out there that we have a lot to offer you in our communities. And um, I think we can just get, get moving without having to wait for this, whatever decision you choose to support today. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Darren, did you have any response to member board on those comments? I think the point's well made. Thank you, Madam Chair. Really, really good points made by uh, Member Ward. Uh, and if I if I can reassure that the, the start point for us is the redress to accept what has happened previously and to understand how we make that better for the future. Uh, there's a real commitment from the executive to work collectively as to not just having strategies that sit on shelves, but having something that we can implement and actually has some practi practicality to it, I think is the best way of saying that. Um, we've heard from um, uh, Deputy Mayor Ann Court, um, who's passionate about um, parking uh, in our communities and what that means for the disabled parks and people who don't adhere to those rules. So um, I know Dean's on the on the line and, and I'm sure he's working at how we better implement um, what we what we need to ensure that we've got public safety. So there's a real commitment there for change from us. Thanks, Darren. And I know there's a round of applause from around the table when we talk about uh, strategies that don't sit on the shelf. So thank you for reiterating that again. Uh, I don't have any further hands. So Councillor Stratford, your right of reply before I put it to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge also the community board representatives that attend the Disability Action Group meeting. I acknowledge also um, for Andy Finch's team, a lot of this does sit, sit with, within there and he has managed to have staff attend over the last few years. Unfortunately, we have, um, it's been a little quiet at our meetings. We haven't been able to meet as often due to COVID, but we are attempting to push ahead with our meeting in Zawane uh, this Friday. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll br bring this all up there because it's actually not on the agenda at this stage. And one, one of the um, reasons that we have to meet in person is because we have deaf people and trying to um, set up um, meeting, you know, their, their, their need to meet in person outweighs the risk of uh, the pandemic and the, you know everybody's vaccinated so you know we we make a call in this instance i just wanted to make it clear to everybody um, why we're meeting in a small um, group on friday and it'll be really it, august was our last meeting august last year and i'm sure that i'll have a massive list for andy's team of uh, footpath um, uneven you know uneven footpaths or crosswalks that are um not um suitable yeah thank you thank you councillor stratford so um uh, that brings us to the vote the recommendation in front of us as i read earlier 
that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that Council A agree that access and equity for people with disabilities policy should be the amendment, and B agree the strategy is the most appropriate way to address access to council services, facilities, and assets in the far north. Moved by Councillor Stratford, seconded by Councillor Collard. I am in support. Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. Support. Councillor Foy. Aye. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tipania. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. And Member Ward. Aye. And that is carried. Thank you, everybody. That brings us to item 5.2. Parks and Reserves Policy Development. Apologies, I'm just going to take time. It's a juggle of the multiple screens uh, when sharing. So the recommendation in front of us is that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that Council adopt the Parks and Reserves Policy. Uh, I am happy to move that. Do I have a seconder, please? Yes. Councillor um, Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Foy. Uh, Darren, over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you'll see in, in the report in front of you, there's been <clears throat> considerable amount of work that goes back a number of years. We look at when the uh, when the policy or the bylaw rather expired in 17, uh, work started on the renewal of the policy in 2020. Um, Ross Baker is with us today who has taken on the challenge of refreshing this uh, and giving you um, what is a really comprehensive document for consideration. Um, just one one comment that I'll make before I pass to Ross in this one's in particular for Councillor Foy um, who is, is passionate about understanding what our um, I'm going to say our reserve stocks look like. Uh, section 3 of the report talks about um, uh, the selling of and what the process is uh, if, if, if we do uh, dispose of our of our reserves. So um, I'm sure that's something that um, that you have picked up in your reading. So um, Ross, I'll uh, I'll hand to you if you could speak to the report, please. And you're just on mute. Right. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ross Baker. I'm the Parks and Reserves Planner at the Council. Um, this report before you uh, considers a new draft Parks and Reserves Policy, as Darren said, to replace the uh, existing Reserves Policy 2017. It's to provide a non-statutory guidance to elected members, staff and public on the operation and management of Council's Parks and Reserves. Um, the, the draft Parks and Reserves Policy is essentially an updated to the current legislation, incorporates parks, which the current policy does not, uh, remove some non-parks and reserves related matters, for example, trees on road verges, uh, naming of uh, facilities and road names and so forth. Uh, and it also um, now covers matters that aren't in the current reserves policy, for example, detailing leasing and licensing, acquisition disposal and land exchange, easements and the like. Um, the, the proposed policy does not address enforcement issues. Those are covered by part five of the Reserves Act and the upcoming Parks and Reserves Bylaw, which is a block of work that's um, kicking off now. Uh, and complementary to this is a higher order planning document um, will feed into the Parks and Reserves Bylaw, which I mentioned, and also into the proposed Public Open Spaces Strategy, uh, which is also a block of work that's starting now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ross. Councillor Foy is seconder of the motion. Uh, would you like to go first with your comments and questions? And then I think I've got Councillor Stratford. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, Ross. Um, welcome to our team. It's great to have a reserves planner back on board. I um, and thank you for bringing this paper to our council. Um, so, 
I think what I wanted to raise in um, Darren's highlighted about the number of reserves that we have and if we have land then we have options um, and just because it's one land use now doesn't mean that that couldn't change in the future. Um, because we've been doing a lot of work around the Turku master plan, um, it's been evident that there's some really strange historic things that um, are present with our reserves, um, both under the Reserves Act, um, under the district plan, and then a whole lot of really quite old um, assets within those reserves that you know, have land use that uh, may not be consistent with the Reserves Act or with the intended future use by the community boards. Um, I guess as a councillor, I would like to highlight how expensive and how time consuming reserve management plans are. Um, and I guess how we're going to approach that strategically, given the number of reserves that we have and the two reserve management plans we have for the whole district. Um, so a staged approach with priorities and spatial planning through the community boards is what I see as a significant opportunity to do that at a larger scale um, so that the staff know what they're wanting to do to get on with the job. Um, and we don't have to look at it at a piecemeal approach, reserve by reserve, we can actually plan whole townships. Um, so I know that Kitty Kitty has been done first um, with our spatial planning. Um, Taku, we're sort of already somewhat started that in an informal way, not with Darren staff, but through the community board. Um, and um, one of the things that I wanted to ask a question about is halls. I know that um, Ross is a reserves planner, but halls are usually on public reserves or some type of reserve, and it's a building itself. Um, and they're usually quite old facilities and we sort of just let them keep carrying on um, and don't consider the land use options for the site itself where the halls are as well. So are we able to cover that at all uh, or will that at all be addressed um, through this policy? Um, Madam Chair, in response, um, Councillor Foy, the reserve management plans aren't required for local purpose reserves unless specifically required in the Gazette notice. Um, most halls historically are on land that are typically classified as local purpose community hall sites or community use sites. So they don't require reserve management plans. Um, the other point on reserve management plans in section eight of the policy I've um, outlined in there the groupings of omnibus and individual reserve management plans and how we propose to tackle that. That hasn't uh, identified the, the rollout as such, but it's how we're looking to group them. That m might provide you some, um, some guidance there. Uh, in terms of what the council looks to do with land containing halls where those halls are derelict and, uh, and due to be removed, if there are any in that situation. That's a um, probably a, a case by case review, I would say. Um, happy to be supported there, Darren, uh, if you have a comment on that. Um, Thanks, Ross. I was just putting some comment in the chat um, for you, Councillor Foy, um, but the, the halls will pick up in our infrastructure um, uh, social work that we look at. Uh, and I note that Andy's on the call uh, and I understand that there may have been some discussions with member oh, Edmonds actually from uh, Kaiko Hokianga uh, looking at delegations around halls. So there, there's, a, there's still a fair bit of work to be done, um, but it's something that we are mindful of. Aging infrastructure is costly to, um, to any council, so really good question. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Councillor Boy, um, you keep it brief. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, just in response to what um, Ross has said, um, personally, I'm more of an outcomes person rather than the reserves management process, you know, to get to where the outcome is. I, I wasn't necessarily about the reserve management plan. Uh, what I'm highlighting is our council has a halls policy, and then now we 
having a separate reserves policy. Um, the point is that they all interrelate and, and structures on reserves include halls um, and the policy brings up revenue for reserves. Um, and the delegations are all under the community board. So I was just like, well, why do we need a separate policy for halls when you can cover it in this? Point well made, uh, Councillor Foy, and we can pick up that conversation uh, as we go forward, I think. Uh, I've got Councillor Stratford, Member Ward, and then Councillor Clendon. Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge the amount of work that it has been to um, review this this policy and I appreciate the time that we had as elected members to input into this. Um, I'm quite well connected with the Kawakawa Domain Management Committee however and they they don't recall having um, been engaged with on this uh, and I, I think it's really important that we have uh, comprehensive communication on it, highlighting some of the things that have fallen out of the policy that will be met with other policies, what the timelines will be for those, for example, the smoke-free smoke, smoke free, um, line that's taken out of there. And also, um, you know, as a community board member, when I first started, there was some uncertainty about what the domain boards were. So one of the um, things that you know, what their names were and who they were because there'd been some contact lost and that's why they were put into the 2017 reserves policy. And so the actual list of those not being in there is a concern for me. Um, but yeah, other, otherwise I am happy to support this, but I, I feel that there is some risk that uh, the public are going to be upset if they aren't if they don't read this policy with the report, which um, details all the, you know, things that are missing from the policy, how they're going to be met. Yeah. Kia ora. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stratford, and perhaps we can get some more detail around the timeline of some of those works when we discuss the quarterly business report later on. It could be a good question that you might like to raise then uh, to address those gaps. Uh, Member Ward, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, a big subject, something I feel I've been involved in all the way through in all the workshops, but I do feel we get to the end and it's kind of rushed. But um, just a few things I'll touch on. Um, page 53, um, when we talk about um, engaging with developers investing land, we do mention waterways, but um, we have had instances of beaches and I really don't consider, it's the interpretation of the document really in the wording. Um, Beaches would be something that the community board uh, would be very keen to see included um, in that. And I guess consistency, because on page 58, we refer to water bodies. Um, perhaps it's a better, better uh, expression. Um, encroachments, massive, massive, massive. You know, red lights all round. Um, it's huge, it's happening. And we are totally under-resourced to deal with this. Um, one of my main concerns um, in reading this is really the definition um, of legacy. Legacy is something handed down to you. You could receive it last week or 50 years ago. So we are now facing problems of properties changing hands and work being done and they're claiming to be historical or legacy because it was something was granted many moons ago and there is an encroachment on the reserve. We need to really, COVID's highlighted this, I've mentioned it several times at council meetings and workshops, we need to really get this wording right and we need to be able to monitor and enforce this moving forward for future generations. So encroachment is something that I am um, quite concerned about. On, uh, in relation to what, what Councillor Foy was discussing in relation to halls, uh, another thing that I feel hasn't been addressed with clarity in here, and I could be wrong if it's somewhere else, um, but either under disposal or with establishment of structures on reserves, maybe there needs to be a disestablishment of structures on reserves rather than just a disposal. I am just have been looking at the disposal versus, for example, um, from a community board perspective, if we're going to demolish or remove any structures on our reserves, I think the importance of the retention of the site or the land um, for future community needs is really high priority. Um, we we talk about 
you know, not land banking, but but purchasing sites of significance. Most of our structures and reserves have, they are sites of significance. They're there for a reason. They're not all just given as a result of a um, subdivision or developer contribution. So I would just like a little more clarification in there on that, just to tighten it up so that we don't um, get rid of sites because they've got a crappy building on them, but we actually look at the value of the site within the future planning of the community. Uh, top of page 59, um, there's just an omission there. The land exchange must be beneficial to the part or reserve. The, 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 the wording needs clarification. It should be the land exchange must be beneficial to the park or reserve. So thank you. It's all, Madam Chair. Thank you for that, Belinda. Darren, did you have any response to Belinda uh, particularly and her call for more clarity? Sure. Um, through you, Madam Chair, thank you, Member Ward. Um, firstly, for picking up the, the typo, we'll rectify that. Um, secondly, for highlighting the issues that we face and, and, and talking about legacy issues, uh, and you and I have worked on this previously with encroachments that uh, there's a, um, I'm not going to say an appetite, but there is a real attitude of if it's there, it's able to be used, and that's something that we need to work on. And um, I note that um, uh, Dean Myberg is on the call today, uh, and his monitor team, monitoring team works tirelessly uh, in an attempt to respond to, and, and that's the approach that we've really had, is that being able to respond to the public when they raise these concerns with us, uh, as opposed to looking at something more proactive. And of course, it's all about uh, cost to the ratepayer. So that's really important for us balancing out what the cost and what the risk is and how we respond. So um, thank you for bringing those to our attention. Thank you, Darren. I note uh, Dr. Myberg has just raised his hand, so I'm just not sure if you'd like to add to that briefly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to point out that our staffing, and this has been raised before, we have two compliance monitoring officers for resource consents. Um, it's a very small team. And that does create a bit of a challenge for us. I need to point that out because while all of the points that have been made are valid, um, there is a challenge around getting around of what is a very large district with many non-compliance issues. Thank you for that clarity, uh, Dr. Myberg. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's given Member Ward perhaps the comfort that she was looking for. I did have some questions myself about our ability to respond to the historical um, issues. Member Ward, is there anything that you would like to seek in terms of an amendment or further information at this point? Or are you happy to continue this conversation, perhaps at regulatory committee as well? Thanks, Madam Chair. I think this conversation will be continued on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, my concern is really around um, the, the, the time and cost, the resources required to rectify uh, when the pressure's on from the public. So um, I'm just very mindful of that, and it is going to be a problem moving forward, and people are starting to take it into their own hands. So, you know, we're spending time with legal and surveying and lots and lots of meetings. It's taking staff away from BOU, and it does concern me. So... Thank you. We'll continue with it. Yeah. Very good point. Well made. Thank you, Member Ward. Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to raise an issue that I've raised many times before. It won't be a surprise, I think. What's in the policy is generally sound, but I think there's one glaring gap, and it's an issue I brought up last year when we first addressed this, and again at our more recent meeting, and that is that I'd like this policy to incorporate a commitment to dramatically reduce in our use of herbicides in our parks and reserves, in particular glyphosate or Roundup, as it's more commonly marketed. Um, the, the part A of the resolution in front of us talks about health and safety. We know that herbicides, glyphosate is a, is a risk to health. There are people who suffer um, um, allergies, skin skin problems and the likes for exposure. It's as far ago as 2015, glyphosate was identified as a probable carcinogen. It has been banned in California and seriously restricted in 25 other states. The European Union currently allows the use of glyphosate, but that it, um, ends at the end of this year. 
and it's likely that following that it'll be significantly restricted and over time probably phased out. Austria has banned it. Germany will phase it out by the end of 2024. The Netherlands also is in the process of phasing out the use of glyphosate. You know, the, the science internationally and the policy response is undeniably moving away from it. Whereas here in New Zealand, we tend to spray the stuff cheerfully. I've heard contractors say, oh, you can drink it. You know, they simply deny the science. It says it is actually quite dangerous um, over long term. Many of us will never have a problem, but there are people in the community who do suffer ill effects of it. I was told at our pre-meeting meeting that this could be covered under the um, proposed noxious plants management policy. But actually, that's not what this is about. Noxious plants, the moss plant, gorse, wild ginger, all those things we know are invasives getting into our bush and so on. Roundup's generally used largely for aesthetic reasons. It's a quick, nasty way of doing edges, of spraying around trees and posts and building edges, all of those things, all of which can be managed by mechanical means. We can do this quite simply. North Shore City eliminated the use of it many years ago, and I believe Auckland Council is certainly restricts the use of Roundup in parks and reserves. There are easy and affordable alternative mechanisms, and I really think we should um, acknowledge that and move towards that. And I'm not saying we should eliminate it immediately, but I do want the policy to state a commitment to reducing, significantly reducing the use of herbicide, but initially around the most um, well used parks and reserves, um, the Domain and Kirikili, Linvard Park, Tiahu and the surrounding area and Kaitaia. We can do this quickly, cheaply. I think we get a lot of positive response from the community. And I think it's just an idea that time has come. Thank you, Councillor Pinson. Before I ask uh, Darren or Ross to respond, can I get clarification? Are you looking, are you seeking an, an amendment to this recommendation today? Yes, I've proposed in the past that we um, incorporate a, commit, uh, a commitment along those lines into this policy. So, yes, I'd happily put an amendment to it. Uh, perhaps if you could shape the wording of that amendment and pop it in the chat uh, while I ask perhaps Darren in first instance sure. to respond. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So really good questions from Councillor Clendon. Um, those will be picked up in the trees and weeds policy, which we're starting to um, discuss um, and looking at those public places. Um, if that adds comfort to those questions. I guess that's a question uh, for Councillor Clendon. Well, no, as I've said that um, the noxious plants and the like, that's that's a different category, if you like. Um, as I say, Roundup glyphosate is typically used simply as a cheap means to keep things tidy. It's not about noxious plants. Um, when you when we're spraying within our domains, our sports fields and so on, it's not killing noxious plants or weeds. It's managing kaikuia primarily because people find it aesthetically it's not nice. And kaikuia is very invasive. It does strangle plants and the like. So I don't really think a noxious plants policy is a place for that commitment. It's a, it's a different um, environment altogether. Um. Thank you, Councillor Clinton. I've got a couple of hands that have popped up, I think, in response to your questions. Um, if you could work on an amendment to pop into the chat, that would be great. But I might just take uh, Councillor Court and then our CEO, Sean Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's an awful lot going in the chat as well at the same time, predominantly me, so I apologise for that. It's quite distracting. Um, I'm just not clear on where we got to with the request from the elected member some time ago on the on a report on the use of glyphosate. There is a significant cost attached to the alternative. So notwithstanding the very laudable notes that my colleague has made, as prudent governors, I would be very keen to understand the cost and the implications and any unforeseen uh, consequences uh, before we dump, jump down that rabbit hole. So I'm just putting my question more to the Chief Executive, if he could bring us up to speed on where that, that study is, please. Thank you. 
Thanks, Anne. The floor is yours, Sean. Yeah, and that's a very similar comment to what I was going to make. There's no question, Councillor Clendon, about the direction of travel on on, uh, on the mood around herbicides, and that's why, and I'll ask Andy Finch to comment in a minute about how he's going with uh, the work, uh, because this is facing the world and New Zealand, and in particular its councils, and specifically us, but it's a, it's a big piece of work that we wouldn't want to lead the science on, but rather learn the science on. So well, let's hear from Andy in a second. But just in terms of the way to best implement this, um, the in, in principle, a there is a, a parent bylaw in which that, or at least a parent policy preceding a bylaw in which, a, in which any provision to reduce herbicides or to ban glyphosate would be need to be considered by full council. This is a subordinate bylaw. It's not the principal purpose of it, and it would be getting the cart before the horse to um, legislate in a bylaw here, uh, something that has got roots in a more appropriate um, policy first. So it's simply a matter of timing rather than resisting the principle. And uh, the first prerequisite is the work that uh, IAMS is doing on glyphosate. So I'm keen to hear your response to that, but perhaps Andy first through the chair. Through the chair, um, there is an ongoing dialogue since the deliberations meeting on the um, long term plan and a request that uh, a, a report brought to committee regarding the use of glyphosate on uh, road reserve and it was just focused on road reserve at that time. Uh, the NTA are, are pulling that piece of work together, but of clearly um, I just need to get a final timeline from them. Um, my previous work uh, in terms of uh, my previous experience in Auckland um, and clearly here and some initial work that I've seen um, does does indicate the move um, or the direction of travel um, in New Zealand and internationally away from glyphosate. But as has been recognised here, that does come at a significant increased operational cost. Um, any alternative to glyphosate needs um, more intervention is less effective. And I think the general consensus um, around alternative treatments um, is the cost could be anything up to 10 times more expensive than glyphosate. And at a time when elected members are looking at managing the impact of rates increases on the community, then it is something that needs um, careful consideration going forward. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andy. I'm really mindful that we're shifting into um, perhaps debating an amendment before getting a seconder. So Councillor Clendon has now popped an amendment in the chat uh, that council commits to significantly reducing the use of herbicides in parks and reserves in line with international and local best practice. Councillor Clendon has moved that. Does he have a seconder, please? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, now, I'm just going to hit reset on our standing orders. I love how you as a committee test me with my standing orders and chairing abilities. So thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Clendon, your amendment is now on the table. So if you'd like to speak to it briefly uh, in acknowledging the comments that have just been made, and then I'll pass the floor to Councillor Stratford. Oops. Yeah, thank you. Yes, well, I've sort of made the points I wanted to make earlier, obviously. Um, interesting hearing Andy suggests that the cost should be something like 10 times what it currently is. I'm talking about reduction in parks and reserves, and I'd love to see any evidence that the cost differential would be anything remotely like 10 times. I simply don't accept that. The difference would be you'd have to commit more to mechanical management of, of weeds and edging and so on, which is more time for guys swinging weed whackers, basically. Um, that money would be paid into people's pay packets rather than spent on chemicals, which I think would not be a bad thing, frankly, albeit I do accept there could be an increase in cost. But at hearing notions that it's going to cost 10 times as much, I'd love to see some evidence because I don't think it exists, quite honestly. Um, with all due respect, I think that's simply not defensible as a response. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I do think it's a significant health and safety issue, both internationally and increasingly here in New Zealand. We're catching on that this stuff is quite dangerous. I think it would win us brownie points with our communities to see that commitment. And I do think that something should be embedded in this, in this policy. I think it's the most appropriate place for it. And I'll leave it there, thanks. 
Thank you, Councillor Clendon. Before I pass the floor to Councillor Stratford, I note that uh, our governance support team has just got, uh, Aisha has her hand up, so it would be great to just hear from you from a technical point of view first. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to get some clarification. Um, this report is to get the committee to recommend the adoption of this policy to Council. I'm not sure if we're requesting an amendment to the policy to weave in a, a view that we want to look to significantly reduce the use of herbicides in our parks and reserves or whether or not it's a separate standalone motion. Great question, Aisha. Thank you. Councillor Clendon, are you able to clarify on that? Yeah, the intention is to embed such a commitment into the policy, which presumably means we'd simply write in another, um, uh, another provision into it. I guess there's always more than one way to skin a cat uh, in this situation. So, Darren, I'm just wondering if perhaps we're just not ready to recommend the adoption of this policy at this point and what an, uh, an option to look into how we can address this might look like. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could that be uh, that the report is left to lie on the table and more work is... is is done to it and then brought back to committee. If you are of a mind to add the amendment to this, because we will need to obviously make some um, amendments. Um, just in the chat from Briar as well, there's also um, plans um, to have a workshop in relation to the, the trees and weeds policy, which is not just about noxious, but it's trees and weeds. Thanks, Darren. I think that that's potentially a good option. Councillor Clendon, how would that land with you as to leave it on the table uh, to do further work on the glyphosate uh, pesticide side of things, uh, as opposed to recommending through to council now? Sorry to let the, the site on sit on the table, you mean? Yes. Yeah, sure. It'll give us time to address it properly, by all means. Um, perhaps I'm just a little bit stuck on what our processes are at the moment. So I'd just like to call for a five minute adjournment just to get some advice from the governance support team. Uh, I'm happy to move that we go into adjournment for five minutes. Can I get a support, a seconder for that please? Kelly. Yep. Thank yep. you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, we will be back here at 10.57, thank you.
thank you everybody for that time to get some clarity and to get our heads around where we're going to head. Uh, so Councillor Clinton, perhaps um, what I might do is I might just pass the floor to you and ask whether or not you're willing to, whether you'd like to put your amendment to the vote or whether you'd be willing to consider uh, leaving this item to lie on the table at this point so that staff can revisit and um, look to address your concerns and bring it back. Uh, I'm in your hands at this point. Yes, I'm happy to withdraw the um, current amendment and either I or leave it to you to propose an amendment that we let this lie um, until we've had a proper conversation about the use of herbicides in reserves. Uh, thank you. Councillor Stratford, do you support that approach as the seconder? Yes, I would draw the amendment and leave the report to lie on the table. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Madam Chair, the default position remains that Council has a mover and a seconder to adopt the strategy and recommend, uh, recommend the strategy be uh, forwarded to Council for adoption. So I will formally move that the matter be left to lie on the table. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Uh, Councillor Stratford, were you happy to second that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think at this point we are probably confident to put that to the vote uh, and move on knowing that this will be coming back to us again. So we have an amendment on the table that the report be left to lie on the table. To get, Aisha, do we need to capture any further details than that? I think it would be helpful for staff. We try and ensure that any motions on minutes reflect the full picture and can stand alone. I agree. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Court, have you got some suggested wording you'd like to pop in there as the mover? Madam Chair, may I comment while, while Deputy Mayor is thinking? Um, just an option because this this obviously puts this whole paper off for another strategy policy and plans cycle before it then goes to ordinary council meeting. One option would be for staff to take this action between now and the next ordinary council meeting where it would normally be approved and for all of you plus a couple of others to consider the the final policy at that point. So that would make the amendment something more like it's um, it's approved subject to reconsideration of Councillor Clendon's point in the final draft to go to OCM. Uh, thanks for that suggestion, Sean. I think at this point I'm not entirely sure what the time frame might look like to get the uh, approach captured in the policy that the committee might be looking for. So I'm happy to proceed uh, with just leaving it to lie on the table. Uh, and Deputy Mayor Court, if you've got any wording that you'd like to add in there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just in response to the Chief Executive's suggestion, the Council is not a formal uh, debate like a committee, and I think this paper does need to come back to the committee uh, so that elected members' concerns can be considered. So with that in mind, I'm happy to, and I notice Asia's dropped the box off the screen, so I can't read off it anymore, but the item be left to lie on the table, and I'll pick up Councillor Clendon's words to enable staff to consider capturing a reduction of herbicides within the policy. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Uh, Aisha, if we could get that amendment on screen, please. And I think at this point, I'll put it to the vote. Did I uh, capture that correctly? Uh, Madam Chair, with your grace, uh, reduction to the use of herbs be captured in the policy. Thank you. Ooh. Excellent. Thank you for that, Aisha. So we have an amendment on the tables that the report Parks and Reserves Policy Development be left to lie on the table to enable staff to consider a reduction to the use of herbicides uh, be captured in the policy. Moved by Deputy Mayor Court, seconded by Councillor Bradford. Uh, I will put that to the vote at this point. Uh, I am in support, Councillor Clendon. Aye. 
Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. In favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. I believe Councillor Tipania has left uh, the meeting at this point. Councillor Vucic. Um, aye. Member Ward. Aye. And that is carried at this point. Thank you, everybody. That brings us to the end of item 5.2. Uh, and on to 5.3. Um, thank you to the staff for supporting us through that. Uh, it's always a, a tricky one to work through how to get some policy changes on the table. So um, I think that's a good conversation for how we look to deal with that as a committee going forward. So item 5.3, the review of class four gaming and TAB venues policy. We have a good chunky uh, recommendation in front of us that the strategy and policy committee recommends that the council A, note under section 102 of the Gambling Act 2003 and section 97 of the Racing Industry Act 2020. The class four gaming and TAB venue policy has been reviewed regarding the social impacts of gambling in the far north district. B, approve under section 102 of the Gambling Act 2003 that the class four venues policy component of the class four gaming and TAB venue policy continue with amendment to improve certainty. C, approve under section 102 of the Gambling Act 2003 that the relocation policy component of the class four gaming and TAB venue policy continue with amendment to further align with the intent of the class four gaming sinking lid policy and D, approve under section 97 of the Racing Industry Act 2020 that the TAB venues policy component of the class four gaming and TAB venue policy be replaced by a sinking lid policy. If you're all still with me, do I have a move for that, please? Happy to move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. A seconder? Happy to second, Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Darren, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> The, the report that you have in front of you today is the culmination of considerable work um, by the strategy team uh, and this and previous discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that we are seeing amendments made um, to the policy to ensure that it aligns with current strategies and legislation. Um, there's a lot to take in in this report and you will see there's a considerable amount of money that goes out of out of our district and out of uh, the community's pockets. So I'm really pleased that this is in front of you today for, for debate. Um, and on that, I'll pass to Briar for any, Briar, any special interest that we might need to make elected members aware of. Um, so the policy is due for review um, and, and as part of that review, we are required to take into consideration the so social impacts of gambling in our district. Um, so also amendments are required as the Racing Act has been replaced by the Racing Industry Act. And so then we have an opportunity to ensure that the different components of the policy are consistent and that the language is clear. And then any amendments to the policy do require a special consultative procedure um, and further engagement will be required. So, yes. Thank you for that, Briar. It's an excellent in-depth report and I really enjoyed being part of the process that your team went through at the end of last year uh, in terms of shaping this from a co-design point of view. It was um, it was really, really good. So I've got Deputy Mayor Court as the mover. Would you like opening statements or questions? I do have a question. Um, this one garnered significant public interest the last time we, we took it out. Um, and I anticipate that it will again. Uh, I'm delighted, delighted to see that as a result of our thinking lid policy, uh, venues have dropped from 25 to 19, if I read the report right, and machines have dropped from 314 to 273, so we're down 41, so that's fantastic. I'm saddened, therefore, to see that we're spending more uh, with less people spending more. Um, and it's not something that this report can address, but I suspect that might, we just might force people to more online gambling. And all of us would have seen the ads on TV now for these online gambling 
uh, websites where you can go on there and there doesn't seem to be any checks and balances, or at least at some of these venues, we do have some checks and balances. My question, Madam Chair, specifically in relation to TABs, we don't have any, and the policy talks about a sinking lid. And my question is, if we don't have any, a sinking lid isn't quite the right wording for me. And I'm wondering if it's legal for us to, to ban standalone TABs. Briar's smiling, she probably already knew this question was coming. Uh, we do have quite a few that are attached to licensed premises, but as a standalone, um, is that possible? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy and Court. The, um, so uh, yes, yeah, so we can put in a sinking lid policy, um, and in this case, since we do have zero uh, standalone TAB venues, essentially that would be banning standalone TAB venues. So yes, so we are, our options are a sinking lid or a capped policy um, in which the numbers would have to remain the same. So a capped policy would keep it at zero. Um, but a sinking lid policy would align with the sinking lid wording, I suppose, of the uh, class four gaming venues policy component as well. Does that work for you, Deputy Mayor Court? I understand what Brian is saying. Thank you, Brian. But a sinking, a sinking lid, but you're already at zero. That doesn't grammatically work for me, but hey, I've got bigger things to bigger fish to fry today, so we'll let that one slide. Thanks, Briar. Point well made. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Kelly, is the sorry, Councillor Stratford is the seconder. Did you want to ask any questions or make comments? Otherwise, I have Councillor Collard. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Collard. Yeah, look, I'm I'm concerned here that we, um, as much as we, we're dealing with regulations from central government, that we are tampering with people's civil liberties and their ability to make decisions for themselves. Since time began, there have been gambling operations. Just you only need to read the Bible to see that. But I'm, I'm very concerned um, about our hospitality industry and um, the income streams that they current some currently enjoy. Um, TAB is another huge industry in this country um, that pays a hell of a lot of wages and, and survival. Um, and gambling is, is a form of entertainment. Now, I don't do not support gambling to excess by no stretch of the imagination, but I am most concerned that we are, are quite happy to tamper with people's right to do what they want to. Aren't there enough uh, obstacles in our way stopping us doing things every which way we turn without us increasing what is already in place? That's my comment. Thank you, Councillor Collard, uh, for your points there. I didn't hear any questions, so I'm happy to move on at this point. I don't see any further hands. Uh, so speak now or forever hold your peace, otherwise we'll pop it to the vote. I can't forever hold my peace, but... <laughs> Fair right enough, Jake. Fair enough. Right in time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Um, I just would like to give my colleagues some comfort that the report the report is an incredible piece of work. So we I need to acknowledge Briar's. Um, it's very comprehensive. What the report is showing us is that we have uh, high problems, high problem gambling, in low decile, highly deprived areas. What this policy 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 is trying to achieve is to reduce problem harm and the social impact of problem harm. It won't stop people being able to go online and lodge a bet with the TAB online, buy lotto online um, and play some games online. So it's not going to eliminate it entirely. It's not going to impact on people's rights to have a flutter on the horses, uh, but it will potentially uh, reduce the ability for people to go and put their entire wage packet in a pokey machine. 
And as we can see from the report, bigger all of the money is actually coming back uh, to the far north, and that should be of concern to all of us. So thank you, Madam Chair. I'll rest. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. So we have a recommendation in front of us. Uh, it's a lengthy one. I've read it out once, so I think I'll ask for the committee's grace that I won't read it out again. Uh, it has been moved by Deputy Mayor Court and seconded by Councillor Stratford. I am in support of the recommendation. Councillor Clendon. Support. Deputy Mayor Court. Support, thank you. Councillor Collard. Against. Councillor Foy. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Busich. Aye. Member Ward. Aye. And that is carried at this point. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to ask the committee's feelings. Would you like to have a break now or move through one more item uh, before we break for morning tea? If everybody's happy to move through one more, we might just uh, move on with our Easter Sunday policy as well. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Item 5.4, Easter Sunday trading policy. Uh, the recommendation in front of us is that the Strategy and Policy Committee re recommends that Council approve, pursuant to Section 5A of the Shop Trading Hours Act 1990, a new Easter Sunday trading policy be developed, allowing shops to open on Easter Sunday across the whole of the Far North District. I'm happy to move that. Can I get a seconder, please? Happy to second. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Uh, Darren, another excellent policy uh, report in front of us. Thank you. I'll pass the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and th thank you for those comments. Um, yes, um, uh, another really good piece of work done by um, Caitlin, who is no longer with us, um, and seeking to develop uh, new policy because of changes uh, in required and of course, this is this is another shift from central government giving local government um, the ability to make local decisions. So in line with uh, uh, Will Taylor's um, future gaze and looking at localism. So I'm really pleased that we have this report in front of us today. Um, I'll ask Briar to make any uh, particular comment that might be of interest to you. Thanks, Darren. The, so the Easter Sunday trading policy is due for review. And the policy currently allows trading to occur across the district on Easter Sundays. So staff have not identified any issues with the current policy, uh, which enables economic and social benefits for the communities over the Easter weekend. So therefore, the recommendation is to keep the current intent of the policy. But I just wanted to note that even if council was to not allow Easter Sunday trading, pie here has a special exemption, exemption and can trade can occur in Pai here, uh, no matter what our policy says on Easter Sunday. Thank you for that, Briar. I don't have any questions or comments. I fully support uh, the report as it stands. Deputy Mayor Court, have you got anything you'd like to raise? No, thank you, Madam Chair. I support the report as written and the recommendation. Thank you. Do I have any questions or comments from the committee at this point? No, excellent. Thank you. And thank you for this report, Darren. So the recommendation in front of us has been moved by myself, seconded by Deputy Mayor Court. I am in support of the recommendation. Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court. In support. Councillor Collard. Support. Councillor Foy? Aye. Councillor Stratford? Aye. Councillor Busich? Aye. And Member Ward? Aye. And that is carried. Thank you, everybody. So um, we're just going to break for 10 minutes before we come back for the remainder of our agenda. So it's 11.15 now, so if we could all be back at 11.25. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, after a good morning of debate, we're just over halfway through, so we're going to crack straight into item 5.5. Uh, the on-site wastewater disposal systems bylaw. So we have a good lengthy recommendation in front of us. Asia, perhaps if you wouldn't mind just popping it up on the screen um, and then I'll call for a mover. So the recommendation as per the agenda, uh, there are quite a few points and amendments in there. Would somebody like to move the recommendation, please? Happy to move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. A seconder? Yeah, I'm happy to second. Thank uh, you, Councillor Busich. Uh, it's an excellent report. Uh, thank you, Briar. I always, uh, in particular, enjoy reading the summary of submissions and then the staff responses. I get some really good learning from uh, reading those, so I just wanted to point that out and thank you. Uh, but Darren, I'll pass the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for me, this report um, is is a really good detail of the bylaw process um, from start to finish and, and the different stages that we need to go through to actually get it through to recommendation. And if you read the recommendation in isolation, you, you'd, you'd quite quickly get confused. Whereas when you read the draft document, uh, it really puts it into perspective. And so I'd just like to um, echo your comments and thank Briar for the work that um, her and her team are doing in our policy and bylaw space. It's um, it's really nice to see. I think the movement of change that we're creating there. So um, thanks again, Bri. Um, a number of submissions uh, were received as uh, through the process, uh, with one uh, oral submission being had, and and of course you've indicated that it's led to some changes. So, uh, Bri, I'll I'll pass to you. If there's anything of note that you really need to make um, the elected members aware of in this one. Uh, thank you. And no, Darren has said all of my points. Sorry. <laughs> Excellent teamwork there, guys. Uh, Deputy Mayor Court, as mover, have you got any questions or comments you would like to raise? Just an observation, Madam Chair, that this is a brilliant example of democracy in action where the public have had the opportunity to have their say. The amendments have been captured and it's an incredible uh, bylaw, incredibly important bylaw, this one for protecting the environment. So well done to Briar and the team. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Councillor Vucic, as seconder, have you got any comments or questions? No, it is uh, self-explanatory and all straightforward. Um, no, no issues. Thank you. Fantastic, Councillor Vucic. Uh, if I don't have any more hands raised, I'm not sure, Deputy Mayor, you need your right of reply at this point. <laughs> Uh, so I'm happy to put it to the vote. Thank you. So the recommendation in front of us on the screen as it stands, I am in support of the recommendation. Councillor Clinton. I support. Deputy Mayor Court. In support. Councillor Collard. Support. Councillor Foy. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. And Member Ward. Bye. That is carried. Thank you very much, Briar, and your team for an excellent piece of work and another um, nice little green light to go on our uh, bylaw reporting framework. So thank you. That brings us to our next item, item 5.6, vehicles on beaches. So it's a review of vehicles on beaches bylaw. The recommendation in front of us is again a lengthy one, so it's up on the screen there for anybody. Would somebody like to move that for me, please? I'm happy to move the recommendation uh, to get it on the table. Can I get a seconder, please? Happy to second. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Uh, Darren, the floor over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Um, again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kirsten, the report writer, uh, who also um, played quite a substantial part in the in the on-site wastewater uh, bylaw that we've just um, discussed. Um, for me, that this this report shows flexibility in the way that we are, are thinking and approaching by bylaws. We, we've identified a, a gap and a need um, that needs to be addressed um, at pace. Um, noting that we have a bylaw that was meant to have been reviewed uh, in March of 2020, 
um, and because of competing priorities um, and I, I really guess things beyond our control, uh, this has taken some time to get in front of you. So um, I'm really pleased that we have the report for you to debate today and look forward to taking direction. Uh, at the end. Um, so Kirsten, I'll, I'll pass to you. Is there anything particular that you'd like to touch on for this report? Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you, Darren. Um, through the chair, I'd just like to um, quickly go over um, just the the essentials for this report because there's quite a lot of detail in it. Uh, the report, as you can see, it contains a number of recommendations, but the core of it is to recommend that the current vehicles on beaches bylaw, uh, the provisions in that should be included in the new road use bylaw. So the vehicles on beaches bylaw will revoke in March, uh, and it currently prohibits vehicles on Cooper's Beach. That's the only scheduled beach at present. Consultation with the Cooper's Beach community identified that they are happy with the prohibition on vehicles and they're happy for that to continue. Uh, we can include provisions to cover this within the new road use by law um, and this uh, the reports identify that this is the most effective option. Uh, since the road use by law has already gone out for consultation, this report also, uh, also includes a recommendation to take these additional provisions covering vehicles on breaches um, out for consultation uh, and we need to do that fairly swiftly. The time frame is short because the road use by law uh, needs to be in place by June because that's when the parking and traffic control by law revokes. So it's a, a fairly complex, there's a lot of moving parts, but essentially uh, the provisions in the Vehicles on Beaches bylaw are to prohibit vehicles on Cooper's Beach, and we want to continue with the same uh, same provisions and put them into the, the draft road use bylaw, which is uh, currently well underway. I think Thank that's you. probably the... Thank you, Kirsten. As mover of the recommendation, um, I'll jump in. I have to admit that it, it did take a lot to get my head around. There are a lot of moving parts, but when you look at, I guess, playing the long game, this approach makes sense, and I understand why it's the recommended um, approach. I think page 127, there's a disadvantages statement, and I think I've raised this before, but that really highlights for me the need for us to look at how we communicate our bylaws so that we're actually making them relatable to our public as we look to make our bylaws smarter I guess the question is how do we look to make sure that our communication evolves with that so that uh, our the members of public can keep up to play uh, I was just hoping that you might be able to touch quickly on um, there was a question that came up that councillor Clendon raised at our draft review uh, just in terms of the reasonings for the oral submissions being heard prior to the end of the written submission period. I was hoping that you'd be able to just touch on that briefly for the committee. And my other question was just around uh, the opportunity, especially for community boards to have input into what those schedules will look like, knowing that that's the, the bolt on piece to the bylaw. Uh, those were my two questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, so both those questions. Um, so the first question uh, about why the time frame is as it is with the oral submission state being set uh, within the time frame for the written submissions. Um, so we've we've got a fairly tight time frame, um, which is just under four weeks. There isn't actually a minimum time frame specified for consultation. We like to have at least four weeks. So we're a little bit narrow, but it is still uh, well within an acceptable time frame. Uh, the reason for for that date being chosen for oral submissions is that that's a date that the committee is due to meet, um, but we have also enabled a provision for that date to be moved if need be, if we have a number of submissions or, or, that are wanting pre to present orally. It may be that we don't get any oral submissions, so it's a little bit of a, an evolving thing about what sort of time slot's going to be required. Um, but in order to meet the deadlines to get the road use bylaw uh, finalised and adopted, did, we do need to stick to a very, very tight time frame. So yes, I agree, it's not ideal, but it is workable um, and can be done uh, this way. 
the second question, um, so um, that's to do with local consultation, community board involvement and consultation with different communities. So the schedule at present only has one beach on it, that's Cooper's Beach. Now there was quite extensive engagement with other communities and there's uh, a variety of communities that are discuss that have have views on this. The views are quite mixed uh, further afield than Cooper's Beach. Um, so there certainly would need to be really um, deliberate engagement with other communities before we added anyone to the schedule. Um, so that's why this proposal doesn't doesn't involve changing any provisions in the schedule from what's currently in place, but there is a, an ability to, for that to be looked at, but it would require very careful consultation with local communities. Does that answer the question? That does. Thank you, Kirsten. Yep. Gives me some clarity. Uh, Deputy Mayor Court is seconder. Did you have any questions or comments? I thank you, Madam Chair. No, I think it's an excellent report. All makes sense. Thank you. I have Member Ward, Councillor Foy, and then Councillor Clendon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, just trying to get things working here. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, it is another another great report. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, my only concern in, in reading this is actually on page 143. If we are going to um, ask for views or submissions or go out to the public, that final paragraph isn't relevant to the item. It actually relates to the new on-site wastewater disposal system bylaw. And please tell oh, me if I'm completely, that's, that's, <laughs> completely uh, out of order, but does it require an amendment or shall we just um, correct that? That's an excellent observation, uh, Member <laughs> Ward. Um, yes, um, I'm sure we we, uh, we certainly can correct that. Um, I'm just not too sure whether we need to correct that and uh, in what way can perhaps who can advise on would, that? Would we require a privacy statement on this? I shouldn't think so with the um, the proposal for the vehicles on beaches, but it's in your hands. I just think if we're going to the public, we need to get it right. Thank yes. Um, I'm, I'm unsure of the answer to that. Um, I'm happy to put an amendment if back. required. Yes, as, um, I'm, unsure, I'm unsure about that. So I will just see if I can get, uh, yes, Briar might know the answer here. Mm -hmm. Box so, of um, chocolate fish. <laughs> <laughs> you will note that one of the uh, resolutions is to authorise the Chief Executive Officer to make minor changes to the vehicle on beaches proposal to correct grammatical or spelling errors or formatting. Thank you. Yeah, we can. So then we can do that without without that here. Great. Thank you, Briar. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Member Ward. I think there will be multiple chocolate fish coming your way after your um your proofing efforts yeah. on this agenda. Thank you. I've got Councillor Foy. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to the staff for giving the report. It was just um, some feedback. Um, uh, I note that Te Oneroa Tohe Beach Management Plan is referred to in here, as well as a significant number of submissions that were made um, previously, 120 of them, um, relating to Te Oneroa Tohe. Um, what, my feedback is about having a map to reflect the areas that that beach management plan relates to because um, Ahipara um, is a settlement at, at the base of Te Oneroa Tohe and I think it needs to be made clear about what is within um, the um, that statute um, that council have to enforce um, as part of their policy and which areas are not within um, the um, the authority of that beach management plan, um, and I think that's really important as well about people making submissions. And um, I like the the map that you had in about um, Cooper's Beach because it you know showed where Cooper's Beach was. So it's just basically a map to reflect that as well. So um, I don't know if I need to do an amendment to that effect, but. Um, um, it's it's just a reference um, as part of the policy. Yeah. Um, thank you for that feedback. Um, I, I'm sure we can uh, include um, some references to maps and the supporting documentation anyway without um, needing to amend this. Yeah. 
Uh, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foy. Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to Chair for just recalling that conversation we had about the submission dates, the oral yeah. submission dates particularly. Um, just to add to that, that I guess we'd all got used to the idea that oral submissions are made in support of written submissions, and most often they are. But what came out of that conversation was realising that people are absolutely welcome just to make an oral submission. If people want a slot to make a comment, they don't have to do a written submission first. They can just book a slot, come and make the submission orally. And I'd certainly encourage people to do that. As I say, my I guess my own understanding was that they were typically in support of written submissions and that kind of becomes a standard. So thanks for reminding us of that. I, just to put it on the record, as I say, that people are most welcome just to make oral submissions without a prior written submission. And I think that's a good thing. That's great. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Clendon. Um, Go FNDC looking at different ways of doing things, hey, and making sure that we're more accessible and more inclusive big ups to us. Uh, Councillor Collard. Yeah, just to, to go a little bit further with that uh, submission dialogue that David had, um, and it, it was in relation to submissions in this particular case on, on uh, Te One or Toye or 90 Mile Beach, and making sure that those submissions are acknowledged. You know, very often, uh, in fact, uh, there are some that are quite specific in their submissions, asking what the perhaps the science is behind recommendations and decisions. And I think it's it's very important that we acknowledge those um, so that people understand why you, know, you, you can't drive on a beach or why the speed limit is 30 k's or it's 60 k's or it's 80 k's. Um, otherwise, they think we're just making decisions uh, because it was a popular one at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. I'll, um, th that's definitely something we, we can um, look into improving the way that's done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kirsten, and thank you, Councillor Collard. At this point, I don't have any further hands raised uh, and I don't need to take a right of reply, so I'm happy to put this recommendation to the vote. Uh, that the strategy and policy recommends that the council do a numerous um, a number of things in relation to vehicles on beaches, and this this will be a process uh, going forward between now and the end of March uh, before it it comes back to us. So I support Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. Aye. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Busich. Aye. Member Ward. Aye. That is carried. Thank you, everybody. That brings us to the end of our decision making reports today and just into the last couple of uh, information reports. So, item 6.1 Strategic Planning and Policy Business Quarterly, October to December 2021. Uh, report the recommendation that the Strategy and Policy Committee receive the report Strategic Planning and Policy Business Quarterly, October to December 2021. I'm happy to move that. Do I have a seconder, please? A second. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, Darren, thank you for the second edition of our update. Uh, I found it really, really useful, good reading. Love the traffic lights and love the fact that we um, are seeing more and more green. Uh, in those work streams. So another really big high five to your team, but I'll pass the floor over to you for any points of note. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, and like you, it's pleasing to see how the report is progressing and the fact that you can, uh, at a quick glance, see where we are in, in, in the big picture things with our programs of work. So I um, appreciate that pro, uh, feedback. Um, a few points from me uh, as a highlight for this quarter. Um, you would have seen this morning. Sorry. Cats. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Tom Frost, who has joined us as the new program manager in the uh, Nothing But um, Net strategy. Uh, and you can see what he brings to the organisation with his previous experience working in the um, telcos. 
uh, he has such great reach into that sector um, and doubling on to the back of how he's working with our community. So really, really pleasing uh, to have him on board with us. Um, some of you will have uh, seen Patrick uh, Smith has returned as well as the new uh, manager in the Te Hono team um, and a number of new new people have also joined to that team. So again, about outreach into the organisation and into the community and how we start to really cement those relationships that we have with uh, iwi and, and, and hapu. Um, and we've already discussed how we will start to look at our MOUs and the audit process and understanding uh, how they are relevant and fit for purpose uh, into 2022. So that's really pleasing. Uh, the draft district plan, um, that's something there. We've proposed that May will be notification date for us and we're working actively in that space to ensure that we're able to meet that date. It's really important that the pro proposed date hits, hits the mark in May. Uh, for follow on work, noting that we do have an election coming later in the year. So something for us to um, to keep a watching eye on. Our Mayor's Task Force for Jobs and Community Recovery Program. Um, so you may have seen late into uh, 2021 uh, a submission and approval for a considerable amount of funding uh, in the realm of $400,000 uh, for investment into um, Kaikoue and looking at the community groups that we'll be walking, working with there and how we incentivize that. And also the, the Berry Bus, looking at how we get our um, people into work and transport out to the innovation hub at Ngafa. So probably for me, those are, those are three or four really, really big um, items for us. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren, and some really great points uh, there. I might leave my questions and open the floor to members at this point. Councillor Stratford, would you like to kick us off as seconder? Yep, sure. Let me just find my, my notes. Uh, the main thing that I have been issued with in the report, um, and I forget the wording, Oh, not to make significant committee changes until new training, and that's around um, our resolution to have uh, Māori appointed to committees or a Māori standing committee. And yeah, I, I really take issue with that. That's a governance decision. Um, when you know when when we made that resolution at the meeting. Um, the aspiration was that it happened this triennium to give some space for like Māori to have some input into what the new triennium looks like as well. Um, so you've got um, some awesome new new staff in Te Hono, Darren. It's awesome. But wouldn't it be amazing if we had a uh, group of Māori meeting with them and inter, you know, intermingling the aspirations of what we as elected members are trying to achieve at our council and off the back of what Spark delivered this morning and that deputation. You know, we've got a long way to travel before we, we're um, functioning um, at a te ao Māori world, you know, te ao Māori worldview like Spark are. Um, and we've got such a high population of Māori in this district. Um, so, Madam Chair, uh, what what is the the step for us to um, discuss? You know, when can we have that opportunity to discuss whether we want um, appointees to committees or whether we just want to do? And I don't mean just whether we do a, a standing Māori committee, which will. Um, help embed some of the flavour and changes that we want to ensure are in place before the new triennium to help Uffy, to help really give, um, you know, the support to new elected members. The new st the, a new standing committee wouldn't flow on to the new triennium, but there could already be some learnings from that model that would help in the tri triennium or help with the new Māori, um, Māori seats that, that win in the, in the new triennium. 
Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to respond to that, but there was something else that I needed to bring up. Um, in the plan, I couldn't see when we're going to do any reserve management plans. And I don't know if um, it came up at your meeting last week, Darren and Cheryl, that you were at um, for Moirua, the Simpson Park um, Committee, they really um, have come into some uh, fun, not, not fun, I'm being sarcastic, and it would have been alleviated if they had a reserve management plan in place. And I think to help empower the community drivers there, we really need to help them do a reserve reserve management plan. And I can't see any um, in the in the in your plan that I can't even get in front of me right now. Yeah. So those were the only two items that I can. Thank you for that, Councillor Stratford. Um, I might just take the first uh, response to your question uh, and be perhaps a little bit cheeky before I ask Darren or Will to respond. But I think this is exactly why we move to a, a structure with our committees of taking the whole day so that we have the opportunity to be able to have these conversations at a governance level, especially around what our priorities are. Um, so I've signaled to the committee that um, there is opportunity to have a conversation at our next briefing session uh, around exactly this and uh, the work streams of Te Hono and what this looks like for us uh, going into the triennium. So I'm just tabling that that could be an option is for us to pick that conversation up following our next committee meeting. Um, if that would work for you, because we do have some time allowed, but perhaps Darren from an operational point of view, if you wanted to respond or I see Will has popped his camera on, so he might have something as well. <laughs> Before they do respond, though, Madam Chair, one note that I um, forgot to make about the committees, about um, Māori on committees or a standing committee, we have the budget in the current current year. We allocated funding towards this as well. Thank you. Thank well, you. you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't want to steal uh, Darren's thunder here, so it may be a bit of a, a, a double act for us, from us, uh, two for the price of one, as it were, Madam Chair. Um, if I can use that uh, old expression that you only get one opportunity to make a good first impression. Uh, this is a, a major initiative for us and we are really keen to get it right. Um, from a democracy services uh, point of view, we, um, we've, uh, we've seconded uh, Casey in full time to work for, uh, for over 12 months to look at uh, elections, Maori wards, uh, this, uh, this committee work uh, and, uh, and onboarding. We're working hand in glove with the Tohono team uh, da uh, Darren has only recently been able to uh, fill the gaps that he uh, that he had. Staff who left, I think, under my watch, as it were, Darren, you will only have the opportunity now to, uh, uh, to to fill those posts. So we're working very hard, Madam Chair, to try and ensure that we can deliver something which is fit for purpose rather than go off a bit half-cocked. That's why there's been some delay. I don't know if Darren wants to add to that. Thanks, Will. Um, a really good introduction, uh, and you've made some really, really valuable points there. There's just some police cars racing past. Apologies. Um, the, there has been a, a fair bit of change and a lot of gap in in that team. I am I'm mindful of I'm mindful of the the tempo of work that that we currently have in front of us, and I'm mindful of uh, meeting the expectations of our elected members uh, and our communities. And also on, on the back of your comment, uh, Will, uh, this will be an election uh, like we have never experienced before with the introduction of Māori wards. So ensuring that we get this right is critical, I think, to the success of FNDC and, and, and to our reputation. Um, and so a lot of discussion and perhaps on my part, a lot of rethink, rethinking and reflecting on what we've previously done or not done, uh, as the case may be, uh, and how that influences our future thinking. So I, um, 
I'm really keen to see how we can progress uh, representation and participation. I think those are, are, are two very different but very complementary things that need to be factored into what the future of FNDC looks like with, uh, is it an advisory committee standalone or representation participation through the current committees that will perhaps be formed into the new triennium. So um, I, I'm not looking to make excuse, I'm simply looking to explain the method of thinking into how we, um, how we progress this. Thanks for that, Darren and Will. I'm not sure if you've given Kelly, uh, Councillor Stratford, entire comfort. So, Councillor Stratford, perhaps a suggested course of action. It's unfortunate that Councillor Tepanier isn't with us today as the portfolio holder. Uh, so, it may be a conversation that we need to pick up uh, with him in the first instance and look at how we uh, can look to get the outcomes that uh, I think that resolution was signalling. How does that land for you at this point? Yeah, I don't don't feel like. Yeah, I, I can see it not happening, to be honest, and I'm not happy about that. Thanks. Let's pick that up offline and we'll see uh, how we can move it forward. Uh, I have Councillor Foy with her hand up next. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thanks, Darren, for going over that um, great report. I um. As you know, I'm passionate about planning um, and I really liked the um, workshops that we had about hazard planning, um, particularly with climate change, um, with the specialists in climate change that provided global examples of um, how that can work in practice. Um, at the end of that workshop, I did ask about um, alternative housing designs for land use planning uh, for our um, council given the large geographic areas of um, both flood and coastal hazard for the far north and given our housing crisis. Um, I'm just wondering about um, the timeline and the forum for elected members to um, be given practical examples of permitted baseline development. I don't know if Greg's here, he will understand the language I'm using, um, for for particularly for housing opportunities um, in development within hazards within the permitted baseline or restricted discretionary or controlled activities um, to allow for housing specifically um, and ensuring that those are covered under the Section 32 analysis reports that the staff, I'm guessing, are currently preparing. Um, so I don't know if Darren wanted to respond to that or one of the other staff. And second to that, um, Council of Courts asking me to speak English. Um, so um, second to that, um, what I thought was interesting in this report is that there's a great table which underlines the engagement levels, but for some reason the Taipa Waste Water Treatment Plant Consent Renewal has got a different level of engagement being collaborate to that of the Kaitaia Waste Water Consent Renewal, which is consult. So I'm not sure why we're approaching wastewater treatment plant renewal consents differently in the level of engagement, but um, that was a question um, that that I had as well. So, thank you. Who wants to answer that? Sure. I, um, th thanks very much for the questions. Um, through the chair, uh, I note that Greg's not on the call. He was with us earlier this morning, so I'm quite happy to take that offline uh, if I can, Councillor Foy, and we can have that discussion um, to give you a level of comfort that perhaps will answer your question with the technical aspect needed, uh, if you're happy with that. Uh, and then looking at the, at the consultation, that could be timing as to where it is in the application process. Again, I'll take some advice there from um, Roger uh, and the engagement team to make sure that we've got those uh, those soundings correct for the report in the future. 
think so that Darren, have you to take that offline, um, but just flagging that the current draft district plan does not include those provisions. Therefore, we'd need an update of the definitions, the hazard chapter, and the zonings to allow for those activities. Mm. Okay, really good points. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foy. I've got Councillor Clendon next. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make one slightly opportunist comment and then ask a question. Um, the comment is around, we note from the report a number of new staff arriving. We met one of them this morning. Um, there's a comment that the Te Hono team has picked up three new people, which is wonderful. I know they were quite depleted, but it seems the only way we ever do learn that um, staff have come or gone is sort of by accident. And there are consequences to that. I know this has come up at community board level, that particularly around RFSs and the like, um, an elected member might have a relationship, some interaction with a staff member, that suddenly stops. And then they discover some weeks later that that person has left or been reassigned. It actually happened to me quite recently. There's an RFS um, which has been out for quite a number of months and I've been interacting with a particular staff member. And I discovered quite by accident just a few weeks ago that he's now moved on, I think, to a new role. So that sort of leaves me swinging. I don't know who to talk to anymore. So just a general comment, I think we need a more structured way of elected members being advised about staff movements, new staff arriving and when staff leave. We don't have to know why or wherefores or any of those things. We simply, it would be really helpful sometimes to know that person X or Y has gone and that we've got new members coming in. So as I say, I think that would be a useful thing to, to um, initiate. That's my opportunist comment. The question is specifically on page, where are we? Page 162 of the agenda. There's a comment under item four talking about district planning, about this wonderful new e plan, the new digital format for the district plan. And it says this new format will require guidance and support to maximise utility and efficiency. And I've raised the point before that while staff and other people with some skills around GIS, and a good connection and a nice big screen, we'll find that a wonderful format. People who don't have skills around GIS, who may not have a particularly good connection or a particularly powerful computer, I think are going to struggle to really utilize that format very well. And so I take that comment I've just quoted to mean we are actively going to go out and support and engage with those people and make sure that the maximum number of people can make submissions and understand what it is they're submitting on. So that seeing that line and point four gave me hope, but unfortunately I read the rest of the report in vain looking for some mechanism or some plan or some ways or means that we're going to implement that good intention. So could I have some clarity about how we are going to do that? How are we going to help people in a technical way um, to engage with a district plan once we do um, once it is available for consultation. Well, I see Felicity has a hand up. Would you like me to respond first? Well, yeah, I, think... I appreciate. Apologies, Councillor Foy. Um, I will ask Darren to respond first. Thank you. Yeah. So, thanks, Councillor Clendon. Um, on the on the query in relation to staff movement, it's always. It's always beneficial to for for organisations to talk about roles and responsibilities as to people who are in those roles, um, which I think alleviates some concern uh, to the point that you're raising when we talk about people. Yes, of course, they always move on, whether it's out and off to other opportunities or they gain other opportunities within in council. Um, and there's some learnings for us and an opportunity for better communications. I know that we regularly provide updates through our council meetings in the people and capability space. Uh, the level of granularity may not be to what it is that you are looking for. So um, I think there's, there's perhaps a need for some discussion there. I look at the, the district plan um, and again, how we are looking to make it easier to use and accessible at the touch of fingertips rather than having to scroll through a um, a, a, a paper district plan and looking at the e-plan where it gives you 
all of the relevant information required when you look at your, your property. Um, and part of that process will be led by our comms and engagement team. And, and shortly I'll ask, I'll ask Catherine to make a comment because I'm sure there'll be a few gaps in, in what it is that I'm providing. But there's always opportunity for education. And if I come back to the earlier uh, presentation that we had this morning from Spark, it is about educating the public into what tools and funding and utilities are available for them to use. And so that will be part of that implementation process that we have for our, our district plan and an e-plan, which will be the first for us. Having looked at some of the concepts and the drafts and seeing the e-plan in New Plymouth and Taranaki, um, I'm certainly a believer that this is a positive step forward for us. So, and I'll, um, I'll just pass to Catherine Langford, uh, who's also online to perhaps give a little bit more detail. Just on mute, Catherine. The classic. Thank you, Darren. Um, kia ora tato. Um, just to give you a little outline of where we're going with the district plan work um, to, and to hopefully answer, give you some assurance around those concerns you raised. Um, we've got two strands of work that we're kicking off. One is to make sure that the technical um, platform that the um, uh, district plan is sitting on and any associated documentation is as robust as possible um, and it's really really clearly laid out logically laid out so that we can lead people through that process I'm working with comms right now to figure out those platforms so that's an active piece of work the other piece of work is around um, uh, ensuring access for people who maybe are less digitally capable um, we are just beginning that piece of work as well and we'll similarly be working with comms engagement and the district plan on that. Briar Corbett is leading the design of that side of the district plan work and I'm leading the technical side. So we have a plan in place and I'm listening with interest to your comments. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Councillor Foy, did you want to add something briefly? Oh yeah, just briefly um, to comfort um, our fellow councillors, when I went to the Planning Institute conference, they had a whole stand from ISOPLAN, um, the, the makers of this GEOS platform, and I had a go at it, and it's really simple and easy to use. In fact, as a planner, um, you just hover over it and it comes up with all the rules instead of having to know exactly what rules to find. So um, I think all of the users, if they actually had a go at it, um, like I did in practice, would see that it makes it much more simple to, to navigate the roads. Thank you, Councillor Foy. And I know Councillor Collard, uh, listening with interest, perhaps um, a good approach might be that some elected members volunteer to be test case uh, through that work stream to see how uh, accessible it is to all users. Um, it's got to be dummy proof. <laughs> Member Ward, I've got your hand up next. Thanks, Madam Chair. Some of my um, comments or concerns have actually already been addressed. Um, but just looking at this the last quarter, um, it's a great report, a massive amount of work. If you look at the policy development side of it, we've just ticked off another six, I think. I had two ticked off, I've ticked off another six today. So just again, you know, compliments to the staff for the amount of work at the the last quarter was just huge. And obviously, you know, items and um, I guess um, examples and things in there of, of community board delegations that really needed addressing to enable us to move forward. Um, just on... Page 176, I get the box of chocolate fish today. I don't think we held a forum in November 2022 yet. I think it's 2021, but just pointing that out. Um, the other thing is with the digital connectivity, I appreciate Councillor Kinder's comments about the staff. Um, it's a really interesting one that the community board has been um, nagging about, I guess, for a long time. And it's the advantage of being community based is that we often hear down the road that people have gone before they've left. So I think that there, there is a plus for us at our end um, in saying that we do also email ghosts. So that's not really productive because we can go for weeks, sometimes months uh, with people that aren't there with email addresses that aren't there. So why they're still active and why the emails don't bounce back, that's another issue I guess that needs to be addressed. Um, just on the digital strategy side of it, um, 
although community boards were engaged with, we still have issues, and I think it was highlighted through COVID, and it will come up hopefully, Casey will address this, I'm sure, with the induction phase, um, in the sense that we do, it's not all inclusive because we do have members that are not um, digital savvy and, and do have connectivity issues. And when you're in positions of isolation, you can't rock up to another member's household and sit there. And so it did identify a few issues for us about actually staying connected and having the ability to continue business flow uh, on, a, on a community level when it was really vital. So, you know, I, I guess from our community board perspective, all boards are different. I know Hokianga has a few issues too with connectivity, but somehow, some way we need to actually address this for ourselves before we, <clears throat> excuse me, can actually really bash it out in the community. Because if we are the conduit in there and we we are having issues, then I feel it's something that we just need to pick up at Flax Roots and try and sort out a way of um, both educating and connecting our um, our elected members so that, you know, it's, a, it's all inclusive for people to stand for elections, you know, no matter disregard regarding their... Um, you know, that, I think there's not a lot of confidence out there with people who would like to get involved and can't. So that's just my closing statement. Thank you. Thank you, Member Ward. Will, apologies, I missed that your hand had gone up. Um. Thank you, Madam Chair. It was just to take us back to the point raised by Councillor Clendon on digitisation. I think, first of all, to thank him for raising it. And my response is a, is a generic one and is less about the... Uh, this particular planning tool. <clears throat> uh, digital solutions are, uh, are created for primarily for two reasons. One, to improve the customer experience, to make things better and easier for customers, or secondly, to reduce costs. And if they don't do either of those, then, then they're not worth having. And just to give members some reassurance, we've been uh, piloting putting transformation which includes customer, customer experience, along with technology in a single team to see that if we can ensure better practical solutions rather than technical solutions which look good on paper. So we're working towards something which is more robust and more user friendly in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, for that, Will. Uh, Councillor Stroke, but I know well, that your uh, question around Simpson Park Reserve Management Plan uh, wasn't picked up when you asked it. Darren, did you have a response for that that you can provide now, or would you like to take that offline? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, I completely um, overlooked that one. So, so part of that comes out of the, we now have a, a reserves planner, um, Ross Baker, who you met earlier this morning, uh, and we're working on that policy doc, document, which has been left to lay on the table, um, which, which we need to work through as that proves problem, problematic for flow-ons with discussions and looking at those reserve management plans. So uh, the need for us to move on that report as a point of priority uh, will then alleviate what happens down the line. Thank you for that, Darren. Um, Councillor Stratford, quick response. Um, and what will be the process for identifying which reserve management of which reserves will be reviewed? You know, what, who will be the first cab off the ramp? Yep, good question. So I'm just going to I'm just going to ask Roger Eckers for a bit of advice on that one. Um, Roger, what would your thoughts be? Would need to come up with obviously it will be a work program and how we prioritise uh, which reserve. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been listening in on today's workshop, so it's been fun, actually. Um, we will need to sit down. We will need to prioritise it. Um, there will need to, there will potentially be um, a need for um, a workshop on that. Um, and with Ross leading out that workshop as the reserve planner, um, obviously that work hasn't been um, hasn't been completed yet. But I guess the main thing I want to point out, just going back to the um, back to the paper on the reserve. The reserves policy um, for us, a key thing is getting that reserves policy um, adopted because that reserves policy sets the framework, so to speak, for how we tackle the prioritisation of reserve management plans. And you'll notice in there as well, it talks about omnibus reserve management plans as well. And so how we go about doing that. 
um, as was also discussed today, um, the cost of doing a reserve management plan is high. Um, so we need to be, um, I guess, um, strategic about how we approach that when it comes around to how we pay for these reserve management plans. Um, we are intentionally identifying the, the concept of omnibus um, reserve management plans, but identifying a criteria for that is important. I know that doesn't, doesn't give you the answer of when, but but I'm, I'm just um, indicating to That's through the CE office uh, to look to have some of her concerns alleviated. Uh, I just had a few, I have three questions um, that I'm going to jump in with at this point. So again, Darren, thank you for this report. It's I found it as chair a real game changer to really have a good overview of the work streams that are going on and I think how we're progressing from a governance point of view, especially acknowledging where um, where we've come from in the bylaw and policy space. Uh, so it gives me some really good comfort, so thank you. Um, my questions are quite specific. So my first one, on page 166, it talks about the spatial planning process that we're going through for the Kitty Kitty Waipapa review at the moment, and I note that there's a, a wee orange light there. Um, it also states that there was a report due to committee for this meeting which didn't make the agenda, so I was just looking for some comfort that that's not going to hold up this process, that that report will come to the next uh, the next meeting, but the, report, the process will still continue on uh, in the trajectory that we're looking for. Um, I might just ask all three of my questions first, if that's cool. Okay. Uh, so my second one, page 174, it discusses the development of an external policy or guidelines around te rao Māori, and that's something that we've talked a lot about uh, in, in different departments or parts of our governance body anyway um, for a long time, but we haven't really had any meaningful or robust conversation around it. My question, um, just noting that that work stream is sort of in the pipeline and potentially progressing, I'd be keen to get an understanding of what that scope looks like. I think um, one of the things that I learned from this agenda is that a strategy and an implementation plan is where the doing actually happens. And so for me, my understanding is an external policy would guide how the language is used, whereas the strategy would give us an opportunity to play a really significant role in the revitalization of Te Reo Māori. And given that New Zealand has a goal for that, and our district is punching well above our weight with our speakers, I'd be keen to get an understanding of whether or not there's scope to progress that, as opposed to just having a policy where we say this is how we do it if we're going to do it. Um, so that was my second question. Uh, and then my third question was, um, I think it's actually more of a statement, I'm not sure, but it talked about on page 178, proof of, proof of concept for public Wi-Fi late January to early February 2022. Uh, around the smart cities work and, and the work that's going on with nothing but net. I think just uh, my question is whether there is opportunity for um, realising some of the projects that are in the pipeline right now and how we can be implementing that. And I'm going to put my Kitty Kitty Domain Working Group hat on and just pop our hand up and say this is a space that we've been really keen to try and partner with and achieve some of those outcomes. Uh, so whether there's opportunity there uh, for perhaps Tom could attend to the next working group meeting to talk over how we might be able to achieve that as part of the revitalisation project. And Councillor Foy, I'm not sure if that's something that uh, is being talked about in Tehiku as well, but with our, our open spaces, capital works projects that are happening right now, is there opportunity for us to be realising that outcome? Uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Question. <laughs> um, it, in response, pretty much yes, yes, and yes. Uh, and just to um, elaborate on that, so uh, we are we are looking to have those initial discussions in relation to the spatial planning review of Kiri Kiri Waipapa commencing early next week. Um, unfortunate that we simply couldn't meet the deadline to have that report in the updated timeline that we discussed late last year with you um, in front of this committee. So we will we will have that to you at the next committee. Um, if I if I think about um, where we are where we are moving to in the Te Ao Māori space, look at the the commitments that we made in the long term plan and how we need to stand true to those. Um, something again, coming back to council. Uh, Clendon's comment, something that you get when you bring new people into the organisation, uh, uh, perhaps different viewpoints, uh, different perspectives and different, um, I think, um, areas of expertise. And so with Patrick comes a really neat framework that he has developed 
uh, at Upper Hutt, and uh, he has, or we have Upper Hutt's um, authority to bring that here to Far North District and to look at how we bed that in. So, and, and again, happy to uh, step you through that uh, to give you some assurance as to what that looks like. Um, in relation to the to the third with the nothing but net, I think we've seen in Tom um, a real desire or a real enthusiasm to connect. Um, and if I look at the work that he has done in this space already in a very short period of time, um, the, 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 the challenge for, for us will be to, I think, temper some of the enthusiasm so that we don't overcook uh, Tom in a relatively um, short period of, of, of space. But he's, um, he's in the process of moving from Whangarei to Kirikiri um, and happy to engage at community level and, and I can work with you on that as well. Uh, and I know the C has his hand up as well. Thank you, Darren. So, uh, Sean, the floor is yours. Just a quick comment, and it's slightly out of timing now because the rear accolades flowing to Darren. I just wanted to talk all those. Uh, just, just bear in mind that Darren's running less than 30 staff in that cell, and this report is a really good mop up of all the loose ends. It's a great one stop shop. And he's got a very full program and a very productive um, series of outputs. So, Absolutely agree. Great, uh, great leadership from Darren. And I don't know how he's squeezing so much discretionary effort out of his team, but they're all to be congratulated. It's good work, Darren and team. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we've had some really good uh, conversation. I'm not sure if it's a debate, but we've had some good conversation around this report, which is it's great that we've had the time to be able to do this uh, today. So I agree with Sean. It's Excellent to see the productivity that's coming out of your team uh, and can't thank you enough for that. So we have a recommendation to receive the report on the table in front of us that has been moved and seconded by myself and Councillor Stratford that the Strategy and Policy Committee received the report Strategic Planning and Policy Business Quarterly October to December 2021. I'm in support. Councillor Clendon. In favour. Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. Aye. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. And Member Ward. Aye. That is carried. Thank you everybody for your time and energy on that one. That brings us to our last item for today, item 6.2, Strategy and Policy Action Sheet Updates, January 2022. Recommendation that the Strategy and Policy Committee receive the report action sheet update January 2022. I'm happy to move. Would somebody like to second, please? We will second, Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, do I have any questions or on the action sheet? No? Uh, apologies, Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just it's good to get these, but I just note some of the um, actions are actually now complete, and I wonder at what point or what the process is to drop them off. Um, quite a number, in fact, the things that are already done, they're now historic, and it would just be nice if we can eliminate those, and it looks like there's um, more action outstanding than actually there is, so it'd be useful to update it, I think. Other than that, it's fine, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Clendon. Uh, Madam Chair, through you, if I if I could, um, on the back of the of the quarterly report, it's always timely to ground ourselves so that we ensure that we provide accurate information. And that's a really good point raised. Um, we need to be better at how we capture the workflows uh, into this report. So we'll uh, we'll work on that and have that um, tidied up for the next meeting. Thank you, Darren uh, and Councillor Clendon. Perhaps you and I can just pick up to make sure that that happens uh, before the next uh, meeting. That would be really good. But if I don't have any questions or comments further to that, I'm happy to put it to the vote at this point. Uh, so I am in support, Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court. Aye. Councillor Collard. Aye. Councillor Felicity Foy. Aye. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic? Aye. And Member Ward? Aye. That is carried. Thank you, everybody. So that brings us to the end of our agenda for today. 
another big chunky day, but some good mahi under our belt that we will see most of uh, at the council table in coming weeks. Again, uh, Darren and Sean, thank you to your team for um, an excellent start to the year. Uh, long may it continue, and I'm sure that we will manage to get everything into really good solid foundation before the end of the training and, um, and the benefit of the incoming council. So I will close us at this point with a karakia. Enwai tato. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ko namu te moana, kei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i tātou katoa. Huie, tāu kie. Tāu kie.